Дамы и господа, добрый день. Ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. Um, this is the second day of the Forum of Science Popularizers of the BRICS countries, and we're going to discuss the specific features in the organization of online events. It is very good that despite the pandemics, we still keep talking of offline, and like all speakers, and the audience are sure that the offline is soon to get back. But still, we're going to discuss why it is important to organize offline events. Everybody is used to have an offline events, but still, the audience are wishing for something new and interesting, and the organizers face some difficulties in organizing offline events. So why don't we begin with more general things? Uh, the way you organize offline events. Dinara Hisamova, board member of Science Slam Russia, uh, will be the first one to speak. Science Slam, what is it? What kind of a project is that? Please start with saying that. Thank you, Yana. Um, I have a presentation even with this title, uh, what are the threats awaiting the event organizers? But to begin with, uh, a few words about myself and uh, this project, Science Slam. I represent the Science Slam Association in Russia, which is a body set up in 2016. And starting from 2012, we've been doing events all around Russia. That's an international format for science popularization, and it's been quite well off in Russia. We have several rules. Researchers will speak at Science Slam to share their own research in an interesting and easy to understand way with a time slot of 10 minutes each. The slam will take place in an unusual place. Uh, it could be a bar or a rock club. Uh, some organizers held science slam at some underground uh, forgotten places and the audience will pick up the winner who will get the prize of the audience that is the scientist researcher who will have shared the most interesting and sophisticated thing. Uh, the winner gets this symbolic prize, uh, the boxer's gloves. That event took place in Voronezh in 2019. We had two co-winners there, and over the time we have accumulated a huge experience in the organization of offline or online events, depending on the conditions, and I'm going to tell you now about the key lessons we have derived from our organizational experience. Uh, we will discuss the site and the contractors, Another item will be the audience and the partners, and of course we'll discuss uh, the speakers. Every slide will contain a checklist um, of main things to pay attention to. The first item to discuss is the site. Atmosphere, geography, uh, the audience, uh, occupancy, equipment and technicians, and the cost. Uh, first of all, you need to understand what's the whole point of holding an event. It can't, so the atmosphere is really important for Science Slam. Uh, the atmosphere should be relaxed, uh, hence the choice of the venue, like a bar or a rock club. And the atmosphere should include something unusual, uh, an unusual place to see science at. Geography and the audience, starting from 2019, when we held a slam in the city of Tobolsk in Siberia. And after the beginning of the event, we had to put an additional guard uh, at the entry to prevent regulars from visiting the bar on, on a Friday night. 
and uh, the event we held was very, very unusual. And that is another thing that you need to be thinking about. You need to first make a survey as to who are the regulars to the venue you are going to occupy and what you are going to do with people who come there for their regular entertainment. Well, occupancy or capacity, that is something clear. Uh, and equipment. And sometimes uh, the cost is really important and sometimes we just pay or sometimes we agree on a kind of a barter. Where, uh, where the host agrees <coughs> where the owner agrees to host an event uh, in exchange of a larger traffic. In Ulyanovsk, for instance, we used a newly opened bar, and they agreed to make it on a no-fee basis because they wanted to increase their audience. They wanted to attract a new cohort of users to visit their bar afterwards. So sometimes it happens that we manage to reach this kind of agreement with the venue owners. Uh, that was the Moscow University of Missis. Uh, th that is a slam uh, that they uh, decorated themselves. Uh, you wouldn't imagine you were in just a university building corridor. Uh, once we held a slam at the Moscow State University that also looked beautifully uh, with some cardboard figures uh, cut, carved out, and an old premise was used, and it looked really great. So if you don't have a bar to go to, or if you don't need a bar, uh, just an ordinary premise could be turned into something spectacular. Equipment, that's something that comes quite difficult from time to time. You need to bring it yourselves, and it, it needs to be operational. It happens that during a rehearsal, everything works fine, not when you have the real event. So you need to check out the equipment. You need to arrive at the venue a few days before holding rehearsals, checking the equipment. And of course, you need to double check on the morning of the event. And of course, you need to have a lot of accessories, batteries, cables, cablings. And we have to carry a lot of equipment to replace batteries, to replace batteries in radio microphones or clickers. Cabling sometimes is in short supply when you need to provide an additional connection and you need to have the connectors available on hand like mini jacks or whatever. And all these are things that we have to think about beforehand. Another unexpected thing, projectors can have a bulb blow sometimes, which comes all of a sudden, especially during the event proper, and something all of a, all of a sudden things go wrong and you have to run around the city looking for a new projector, and it's better ask the uh, venue owner when was the last time they replaced the projector bulb, because it was a long time ago, that would be a potential hazard. Another important thing, you need to have good technicians around able to work with the equipment, able to handle it, so that during a, a rehearsal or the event, uh, you shouldn't face a situation where it all depends on your own, with no qualified and skilled technicians around. Another important thing, when your budget is limited, of course, you need to itemize your budget perfectly well. Uh, V video recording and photography, that is important. Sometimes sometimes you need to have a backup for that and you need to have all those people, uh, they need to stick to the agenda, they need to know who and what to record. We, it's a, at a slam, it is important, for instance, that the photographer would record the winner wearing the boxer's gloves and the presentations of each speaker and the response from the audience. So we need to train the photographers before they take up the job. And video operators is the same. Uh, if you 
are a grant holder, you need to be very clear as to when all those materials should be provided, because sometimes you need to file reports to the grant to organizations who gave you a grant or otherwise financed your event. Another problem that we faced is that video camera operators sometimes forget to connect to the audio link on the venue so that you get uh, the sound record, the audio recording just made on the video camera, which is not good in terms of quality. The video could look nicely, but the presentations cannot be heard there. And of course, during the pandemic, it was clear that you need to have backup uh, cameramen and photographers in case you need to replace the ones you hired. Well, the anchor, uh, that guy is in the city of Samara, Again, they need to be well informed, prepared and trained. They need to be, uh, they need to know very well how to pronounce difficult names. Uh, and you need to rehearse uh, those things with them several times to avoid the confusion that what the anchor says is very different from the reality. It sounds like a trifle, but that is something that could spoil uh, and irritate the audience, uh, spoil the audience and irritate the speakers. And that would be very strange if the anchor is ignorant. Another thing to, of course, uh, an anchor should be well at uh, cracking jokes and talking to the audience, but we saw several times that the anchor got infected with COVID a couple of days before the event. So again, you need a backup there on the anchors in case something happens overnight with someone you hired. And it had to be done quickly and you better think about it beforehand. Uh, that is always the case, but during the pandemic it is especially important. Sorry to interrupt you, the time limit is there. Uh, could it? Okay, just a couple of more points. Uh, this is about the graphic design of a museum project we had recently, and the graphic designer, the graphic designer that you contract uh, should know all the uh, logos and brand books beforehand. Uh, that's an important thing because sometimes logos get lost and it's not polite towards the partners. That is really bad. Uh, they need to get all the required information beforehand on the event and all the speakers. Uh, social media, well, again, recently someone forgot to put limits uh, on a particular campaign, uh, having spent much more money than they had initially planned. Again, that should require a lot of attention. And you need to tweak that. Uh, speakers, that deserves a special attention. It is very important for ourselves that the speakers were willing and able to speak and get prepared for that, if if applies. Sometimes if a person is reluctant to become a speaker, we tell them we want them to speak, and that doesn't come off very successfully because of the lack of enthusiasm on the speaker's side. Again, you better have a backup of speakers during the pandemic, researchers that could make a replacement, even to travel. For doing that, if someone gets ill, that's again, sadly, the new reality we face. On the day of the event, we try to take good care of the speakers so they know uh, all information that they need, that they could have a look at their final version, at the final version of their presentations to check it out uh, and prevent any difficulties. Another important thing. It's important that you yourself had seen the final presentations from the speakers in one of the uh, university projects in Ulyanovsk at the Science Slam. Uh, people replace their presentations at the rehearsal 
with the uh, with some me uh, with presentations including some memes that the uh, censors might have been removed so they came all of a sudden all those jokes and memes uh, that were very uh, well were not intended for the actual audience and that came as an unpleasant surprise so that 30 minutes or one hour before the event you better have a look especially if you work with young people the partners well it's simple with the partners you better discuss from the onset what kind of logos or brand books they're going to use are they going to make an introductory word, uh, pick up the list of people representing them so that they're not worried. And of course, you need to meet them, you need to uh, make acquaintance with them beforehand, invite to a meeting or after party, if it is scheduled for after the event, to provide maximum comfort for them. And a separate message about the audience. It is very important that they are instructed when and where to go, uh, where to be, at what time. So th for this purpose, we uh, keep them uh, informed and uh, we give them all, all the links that are necessary. Uh, we need also to inform them about the uh, any rest restrictions, uh, COVID-free uh, areas, or m maybe if uh, uh, vaccination certificate is required you should they should be not noticed we had an unpleasant situation when we did notify them but it was somewhere at the bottom of the posted message so some people did just didn't know and were not allowed in which is a disappointment so you should uh, talk about this loudly uh, also some places do not allow people to bring in big bags or do not have uh, wardrobes, uh, n no place to hang their coats. You should know about that in advance so that people, that your audience would be also aware of that so that there would be no misunderstanding with the security. Also, as far as SLAM is concerned, we want our audiences to be involved and to be happy. We give them every opportunity to speak up and to, to talk to the speakers beyond the presentation time during the coffee break. We also uh, offer them gifts, for example, uh, re encouraging those who asked uh, the best questions. So it's always a pleasure to take out some pleasant things. Also, what is important about your uh, audiences, they may not attend at all, even if, especially if your registration is for free, you should uh, take into account the conversion factor. Definitely 50% will never uh, end up, they never sh show up. Uh, in summer time, uh, there are more people who finally uh, decide not to come because people have uh, many other things to do going to the country, etc. And this is our link. This is linked to our official website and our email. We're always open for discussion, for cooperation. We're always happy to work with our new partners, cities, universities. So write to us, call us at any time. And you're also free to join us in uh, contact here and uh, Instagram. These are the pages where we publish all our announcements about forthcoming events in Moscow or anywhere else. Thank you for your attention and apologize if I overuse my time. Thank you, Dinara. I think you s did a great job summarizing all the essential things for remember. And it's the right time to talk about things in more detail and so the speakers could share their specific experiences. In fact, as a researcher in humanities, I've always been concerned with popularization of uh, humanities. Many projects, including Science Slam, are focused on uh, natural sciences, mathematics, etc., like STEM. 
but humanities are overlooked sometimes. Olga Aristova Brodsky Code project. She will share with us the project, what it is all about. Let me start with a joke. Okay. We're often asked. We're often asked why did we chose what did we choose to be named like this? There's a very old uh, Soviet story that was uh, borrowed from uh, a collection of uh, Yosef Brodsky interviews. So this is this is how this story goes. Brodsky was once visited by his uh, friend, a lady whom he knew, and told him about her visit to a zoo. And she talked to the zoo owner uh, who wanted to impress her and make her and please her and said, well, I can wake up the bear for you. And Brodsky said, OK, I do not have a bear for you, but I can wake up my cat for you, if you like. <laughs> and this was the beginning of a good tradition uh, for him, because Brodsky uh, would then uh, wake up his cat uh, for every visitor. So whenever someone uh, banged on his door or, or visited him, he said, do, do you want me to wake up my cat for you? which was sometimes taken strangely. So, but let me talk about some uh, things which are not especially exciting. Uh, that's about reading. Of course, all of us read things, even the youngsters. But, uh, by the way, by, uh, be be in addition to managing the Josef Brodsky society, society, I also work at the holding, which is called AST. What they do is they uh, count the number of people who do read things every on a daily basis. I will not disclose full information, but based on the recent findings, the younger generation tends to read less and less. And uh, school students, on average, tend to read a lot, or at least enough for them to learn their school curriculum. But starting with the age of eight, uh, 17, they read less. And by the time they reach the age of 25, they almost stop reading at all. And that is a big problem. I will try to tell you how the uh, uh, Brodsky society deals with that. But let me first start by trying to explain why reading is less and less popular. Uh, this country used to be proud of having um, a reading population. Now people mostly read things in the internet, if they read at all. If you really think about it and uh, take an objective view, uh, people who do read do not have any definite advantages. If you are an athlete, you have a chance to enter a university and uh, go through that for free. But if you read books, okay, go on reading. So what? There's another important point. Uh, children who read more than others are bullied more than those who do not read much, because people, uh, children who read a lot are uh, viewed as uh, weak and vulnerable. Um, there are many alternatives to reading, especially when the youngsters flock together, such as uh, sports, uh, games. Mm. We are in the process of uh, doing a survey, and it seems that uh, in, uh, nowadays uh, collective activities are more popular than uh, individual activities such as reading. So the alternative is be between reading a book 
and viewing your news line, which you then discuss with your friends. In order to become a member of a book reading community, you need to go through all kinds of quests. You need, for example, to, to know uh, poems by heart, by Pushkin. You, know, you should know facts about Leo Tolstoy, about his life. So the reading community is very uh, demanding, and you have to be really smart to enter it. If you read something like uh, uh, non-classic books or uh, f f fun books or fantasy books, you are not really recognized as a reader by that community. Uh, let me go back to our uh, project. In March 2016, quite a long time ago, by the way, I don't even know how it happened. We created a book stand-up show dedicated to Brodsky. I, as that was the first such activity in Russia. I think even globally, uh, we tried to, uh, to do Google search, and we didn't find any any anything like that. So we were probably the first to come up with such a stand-up activity. Back in 2016, stand-up as a genre was never associated with anything intellectual. It is only now that we have stand-up options which uh, could, could offer some sophisticated jokes rather than bad jokes. And I was tortured by this thought, or rather uh, an urge to talk to people about books. This is what I've been doing since childhood, and then continued when I worked at libraries. I communicated a lot with the reading community, because before creating the Iosif Brodsky show, I spent six years organizing fest book festivals, book exhibitions, conferences and sessions, all kinds of things. And I was searching for the reason why people tend to read less, why people do not want to read uh, literature which is relevant, and how can, how can we encourage them to read even the modern literature which is printed a lot. Um, in Vladivostok, uh, the show was especially uh, difficult. Until 2019, in Vladivostok, people asked me, are, are there any authors today? Do they write anything at all? In Moscow, that was uh, people, people are more knowledgeable. So as we launched our show, and it became the most popular show in the city. I don't know how it happened. Maybe it deserves a separate analysis. But over the first three years of this show in Vladivostok, we collected all possible uh, city-level prizes, and we won all the competitions. We covered the museums. Uh, we, uh, we left behind all the museums, theaters, and other centers. So our audience was huge, and we hit records in terms of numbers. So how was it possible that a book dedicated project became so popular? Because it's about books which are not a special exciting subject to talk about. We don't see f m crowds of people in bookstores or libraries. What we did was very simple. We shifted the focus to the reader. We followed the advice of Josef Brodsky, who said in his Nobel Prize speech that in the process of reading, every reader is equal to the author. So, how to transform this uh, relaxed and uh, unrestricted genre, such as stand-up, 
uh, how to combine it with very serious literature, literary criticism. So we succeeded in doing so because we created a format uh, which into which we brought some very authoritative people who can talk about books, and that was a breaking point. All of a sudden, readers were aware that they can really uh, speak their mind. You know, we are all traumatized from school times that uh, by this uh, message that we receive. Uh, you may not like what uh, Alexander Pushkin wrote, but you must love him. Uh, but Josef Broski says to our participants, your opinion is the most valuable thing for us. And it's very important to listen to uh, young adults. Uh, we work with adults as well, but for youngsters, we, we, we value them more because they keep learning. With us, they learn to understand what is important. They learn to speak freely. And after the Brodsky cat activity, they s always successfully write their uh, liter literary, uh, literature theses. And they, because they learned to really think rather than repeat what they learned. Thank you, Olga. It was very interesting and important to learn about what you do. I heard about your project, but now I know much more about it. And I wish every success in uh, dealing with the uh, reading a uh, young reading po population. And now that we talk about literature, I would like to share this news with you. Just a few minutes ago, the Nobel Prize winner was announced, Abdul Razak Gurnah, the uh, author from uh, Tanzanian, uh, the British uh, author from of Tanzanian origin. This is the new Nobel Prize winner in literature. So now it's time to uh, uh, invite our international colleagues to join us and speak about their experience. And the first speaker will be from India, uh, uh, Dr. Arvind Ranada. Vilian Prasar, and he will talk to us about uh, VIPnet clubs. Dr. Ranade, are you online? Так, видимо, у нас какие-то технические заминки. Мы ждем Don't seem to have connection yet. We're waiting for Dr. Ranade to uh, be connected. Dr. Anada, Dr. Anada, welcome. And so the floor is all yours. And uh, let me remind you that you have about 10 minutes for your presentation, please. Dr. Anada, if you hear us, uh, you can start, please. And the organizers give you 10 minutes. Dr. Ranade, are you muted? No, I'm not. Uh, now I could hear you. Am I audible now? We yes, говорить. we can hear you as well, and you are welcome to speak. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Can I share my slides? Please go ahead and share. Okay. Uh, 
Uh, first of all, good afternoon to everyone from India. Uh, thank you, Chairman, for giving me this precious time to speak on a prestigious forum of BRIC. I do remember the time allocated to me is very limited, so I will be specific to my topic. And uh, as the title itself says, the success of network of club in the science communication and WIPnet club is one of the case study. So in this presentation, I would like to emphasize on the three important aspects of this presentation. What the organization is all about, about the Vigyan Prasa, what are the major programs that we do, and how this network of science club being established at across the nation is helping as an extended arms of science communication in India. And as a small one of the example, I would like to put on uh, a recent program that we have done it with the na uh, National Mission for Clean Ganga, which is one of the premier program under the Water Ministry under the Government of India, and how this network has made a very impactful, I would say, the uh, platform for communicating and uh, reaching the uh, unreached of the country. Well, as I said, the organization Vigyan Prasar, the name Vigyan Prasar comes from a Sanskritized word for the science communication and popularization, which, which is established in 1989 by the government of India under the Department of Science and Technology. The major objective of us is to uh, create and foster and well-informed citizens, building a capacity programs to communicate and keep the people engaged for the knowledge of the science. And in doing so, what are the major platforms that we utilize as an Vigyan Prasar, as a publisher, we have more than 350 publications. We have been producing a huge amount of radio and audio programs, which more than 500 hours of data is already available with us in the various form. Now, the big question comes when the resources are available, especially the country like ours, which has a very challenging task of communicating the science in the regional languages. And we have been trying to do this with the collaboration with a lot amount of institutions under the state governments. And once the programs are being telecasted or rather been translated and you know, broadcasted, telecasted on the regional channels, it's very important to take this message to the large section of the society. And as I said, as an Avigyan Prasar, we have been part and parcel of developing huge amount of resource material, right from the publications to the audiovisual programs, and then of course, uh, generating a large amount of activity kits and other required material to communicate the science in their own language as well. And of course, having such kind of a huge programs, what is essential is to communicate this material to the public. And that is where the role of establishment of uh, science club came into the picture. And we started establishing and getting affiliations to anyone who is interested to learn about the science and would like to know about the uh, especially the developments in the recent uh, science and technology at the national and the international platform. So wherever there is a group of students of, from the age group of 7 to 17 and have a coordinator of age of about 25 who understands and uh, good enough to take the responsibility as a coordinator gets affiliated with us, the major responsibility of formation of such club is to integrate to network them with the help of societies, organizations under a single umbrella. Once this material whatsoever we have developed is to communicate and to reach to the people, these clubs help us in taking the message to the common people. And that's why majority of our club formations that we can see are certainly in the school domain. However, nearly 40 to 45% of our clubs are in the remotest part of our country, which you know, even at the village level, there is a good amount of people who come forward and get the affiliations with Vigyan Prasa as a part of initiative of government of India. And once they get affiliated, it's uh, become a moral responsibility of the organizations to make sure that they communicate the science to the people 
and as an organizer as an uh, institution we do it by uh, organizing the capacity building programs and communicate the you know, science in the way on the various modes and means so as i said audio visual is one of the program through which we do it but we do have a reach through the four major uh, platforms what we call it as a digital electronic print as well as the social media and on those different platform we have been trying our level best and for the club by the club is one of the magazine that we run across the country and by which the programs the innovations the creativity that at the far flung places of the india get the place to be uh, you know demonstrated to the large amount of people and today if i look at the national level scenario then we have got about 3500 clubs affiliated to us uh, perhaps uh, no the detailing may not be important but at the same time if i just aggregate the entire country in a four different zone then you will see that every state and every union territory of india has been covered under this program and largely we can say that these clubs are being dominated in the school but as i said there are a large amount of social workers who have very keen you know interest in communicating the science understanding the science to the larger interest they get affiliated with us and in this context as i said we have got a large amount of clubs in the school as well as outside as well and the process is so simple that it is an initiative of government in, of india so once they get affiliated they get registrations in the free of cost as an white club category but as they keep on doing the work in the various platforms like a lecture series like a, you know campaigns at the city uh, level at the you know district level or maybe one can say at the regional level by various means and modes they communicate those uh, activities conducted by them to vigyan prasar and then do, when we do those assessments and evaluations of how do they perform and at the appropriate level we promote them from the uh, white club category to then we come to the bronze silver gold and various categories and based on the evaluations they uh, will be given a, a kind of and facilities like in the form of subscriptions of the various you know popular level magazines in the country which are in fact we go to the regional language as well and once they get affiliated we uh, call them as an extended arms of vigyan prasar with the giving an affiliation certificates and keep their moral up we keep on giving them some kind of an incentives not in any hard you uh, know uh, kind of an economical support but in the form of an resources that we have been largely been known as a resource com facility center so as they keep on going go on promoting from one category to other they will keep on getting the variety of the teaching or as well as the you know um, science communication material from within the organizations and of course we do support similar equal minded organizational outcome and the products to be reached to the last section of the society so large amount of these clubs get benefited by such kind of an material that they get it and based on those material they communicate they generate lot amount of programs for the common people and then by this way they come to know about the recent developments at the same time understanding the science in the larger context we have got a large amount of um, tie up with the various equal minded organizations across the country and in fact now we have gone a bit ahead we are also trying to go on the international platforms where this creativity by these clubs get keep on promoting them by and uh, uh, get to know about what are all the things that they have so just to give you a small scenario since this process of evaluation started in year 2017 every year you will keep on seeing the numbers has been increased from the number of clubs affiliated to us and got promoted from one category to other so in 2017 nearly 84 club out of 7 got promoted into different categories similarly in 2018 19 and 2020 you will see that huge number has started increasing and this the kind of work that they have started to know about recent developments in science and technology and here as uh, uh, professor banerji is also there a uh, large amount of programs being done by the department of science and technology such kind of clubs get good amount of chances to be part of such kind of an initiative like a children science congress then they get to know about the science village programs in the international 
you know, science festivals and many, many such things, they keep on getting it. And as I said, this is one of the program I just to highlight because this is the recent one. We had, uh, you know, tie up with the Namami Gange, which will largely be known as a national uh, national mission for clean Ganga, which is the Department of Water Resources by under the government of India. And they have realized the impact of such network and the message that has been taken to the people. And I consider such network has now gone into other than our own clubs, variety of the institutions under the state government, under the central, as well as even on the uh, non-government organizational level also, a large amount of these clubs or the people or organizations started getting affiliated to us. And by this way, there is a great momentum has been generated in the country. And we consider that this momentum is reaching to the you know, a large, uh, I would say, the society. In fact, when we did the small impact analysis, we have realized nearly 60% of our population is now well connected with such kind of a network. Of course, there are challenges in a country like India when there are number one, there is a language is one of the major, you know, uh, kind of a challenge for us. But we do try to do it with the variety of institutions and organizations with we with which we do the work. And with this, I consider that this platform of BIPNET Club is going to be one of the major uh, you know, change in, in the country like India, where such kind of a network is coming up as a uh, uh, you know, great medium to take the science to the people of the country. Uh, thank you so much for giving me a time of 10 minutes. And I hope I manage myself to be you know, covered the topic in a given time. Thank you so much, Chairman, sir. Dr. Anade, большое спасибо за ваше выступление. Dr. Anade, thank you very much for your talk. Uh, I think the experience uh, you shared overlaps somehow with the Russian society of knowledge. And I think people in other countries could recall or maybe set up a new there are projects that would be similar to that, which are very good for science popularization indeed. Let me remind our online audience that they are welcome to ask questions of the speakers. Uh, for doing that, uh, there is a question. Raise a hand or okay, use uh, a chat. And our final speaker for this session, Dr. Tsi Rui, Rui uh, China, Deputy Director of the Beijing Planetarium. He will tell you about their new activities. You hear me? Мы вас слышим, можете говорить. Yes, we can hear you. Please go ahead. Okay. I share my screen. Oh. <clears throat> Is okay? Is all right? Да, да, мы вас слышим и видим. Yes, we can hear and see your presentation well. Please okay. go ahead. Good evening, everyone. I'm Chi Rui from Beijing Planetarium. I'm extremely honored to discuss with you about the forms and characteristics of the offline popular science activities. In the past 64 years since the establishment of the Beijing Planetarium, it has taken promoting the public science literacy as a mission. It has created many offline popular science activities with rich contents and various forms. Moreover, it has trained genera generations of amateur astronomers and provided innovative forces for the development of astronomical science. The offline activities of Beijing Planetarium can be divided into three categories, enlightenment, exploration, and development. The ex exhibition 
hall of planetarium is more like an entertaining playground that can teach through lively activities. The slide on the left is the most popular ex exhibit because it can visually demonstrate the flow of materials in the binary star system. In our planetarium, you also can hear the most faint sound in the universe, that is the sound of gravitational wave. Children had a lot of fun playing in our exhibition hall. The seeds of love for science were planted in their hearts. The teacher plays an important role in the planetarium. They enable students to acquire knowledge in simple terms. The teacher will teach the principles behind the exhibits, the process of scientific discovery, and the comparison between ancient and the present so that children can have a deeper and more widely understanding. In order to attract children's attention, we compiled five to 10 astronomical knowledge into a story and perform it in the form of popular science dramas. The duration of each drama is controlled within 30 minutes. Children love them very much. Interest is the first teacher for children. So the most important goal of enlightenment activities is to cultivate children's interests. Through multi-sensory stimulation like visual, hearing, and the touch, we try to let children have fun in science and fall in love with these projects as well as activities. The number of people who participate the experience, exhibitions and activities in our planetarium is more than 200,000 uh, in every year. How to distinguish between true and false materials, how to recognize different stars by using the international star map, so many questions put forward by teacher would arouse children's thinking, then introducing scientific knowledge and principles through exhibits can help them answer these questions vividly and intuitively, which is an important supplement to the school curriculum. Uh, curriculum. Children of lower grades prefer hands-on practice. They can assemble a telescope uh, sextant. During the hands-on practice, children use their hands and the minds together. In addition, promoting their communication with partners or parents through collaboration and helping them experience the importance of teamwork in scientific research process. For children of higher grades, we have specially designed a series of scientific inquiry topics. The teacher sets a scenario, scenario of races and raises a question. Through guidance, encouraged, analysis and induced discussion, leading the children to summarize scientific laws, solve problems and obtain answers by themselves. In this exploratory activities, children use their hands, minds, hearts simultaneously. In this process, they learn scientific technology, master the scientific method, establish scientific ideas, and cultivated the scientific spirit. 
the planetarium organized more than 300 such activities one year with more than 10,000 participants. Dr. Joy, Dr. Joy we, uh, we apologize to remind you about timing. If we will appreciate if you uh, speed up a little bit. Okay. Thank you. We designed one month offline in deep reading activities to teach reading method, share reading experience, and explain the knowledge in books in detail. We design a series of activities to develop to, to, to develop the expression ability of teenagers. Development activities are usually last for more than one month, one month of more than five times, letting the children participate in these activities for many times and practice repeatedly. More than 20 activities are organized each year with about 500 participants. Under the epidemic situation, we have also taken a series of feasible measures in order to carry out popular science activities on schedule. In addition, the forms of activities has also changed by broadcasting offline activities to the network synchronously so that more than more people who cannot come here can also participate in the interaction. Finally, I hope that after the end of the epidemic, more people can visit Beijing Planetarium and participate in our offline activities. We look forward to working with BRICS partners to strengthen cooperations in science popularization and achieve common development. Thank you very much. Спасибо большое, доктор Рой, за такое содержательное выступление. Thank you very much, doctor, for this presentation. I believe that all scientific museums can uh, borrow from your experience a lot. Uh, let me thank all the speakers. We must stop the session and uh, make a tra transition to the next uh, session immediately. Thank you for being with us.
Добрый день, уважаемые коллеги. Начинаем восьмую секцию нашего форума. Модератор не Артем Акшинцев from Travel Russian Geek. Hello, I'm an ecologist, and my project is about uh, science and tourism. I start. It all started with uh, cyan bacteria. I studied them in uh, Kamchatka, in. Uh, 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 Vulcans, near Vulcans, I took uh, samples, analyzed them, I traveled a lot, all that required money. In Russia, we have problems with field grants. There are many people, scientists, who work in the field, but they cannot uh, receive funding for their expeditions. They leave Russia or they leave science at all. I did not want to be among them, so I decided to go to Kamchatka once to discover new hot springs, uh, to map them, to analyze their parameters. This was a lot of work, but uh, there was no chance or very little chance to uh, secure funding for that purpose. So we ended up at the uh, crowdfunding uh, a resource website. In Russia, there are many people who use crowdfunding for pro to finance protest activities, but science popularization can do as well. So we gathered some funds, we traveled along the route, discovered new springs, we described them, we performed chemical and biological analysis. Uh, that was very good. But we found we need to make more visits to Kamchatka, and of course crowdfunding is good, but it's not enough, and we cannot do that every time. So we came up with this project, Travel Geek. I thought I can uh, tell people about uh, traveling, I le I'm a lecturer and I know the region, and uh, viewers could fund, finance my expeditions. And this, in this way, we launched uh, our first group to study uh, hot springs in Kamchatka. We, were, uh, we got a lot of popularity. Uh, people were reading about us. And uh, we, now it's a well-known project. We have uh, many bloggers working with us, popularizers. And it's a good uh, situation, a good opportunity for studying nature, not from home, but going uh, to where the nature is, uh, to go to the field. And this is a new level of uh, discovering and learning about nature. It's not enough to just marvel the beautiful pictures and landscapes, but you go deeper than that, you, you try to understand why the Vulcans have this shape or another, and uh, you learn about the hot springs, uh, or you ca ca count bears in the uh, nature resort in uh, Baik near Baikal. And we found this big problem, that many people who do want to do science in this way cannot do that because of lack of funding. Uh, natural reserves we are linked to our project, and uh, in this way we succeeded in uh, uh, securing funds, in particular for this uh, bear counting activity. Uh, we, uh, off in this way, we off can also offer tourism services, and this is enough for us to buy fuel for our trucks and uh, buy other things. In the same way, we travel to Africa. Mm. And this is about field work, uh, it's a big region and uh, there are many areas of application of scientific knowledge. 
And uh, there are some areas where some of the best popularizers of science uh, as a group go to those locations and they tell the general public about the, uh, how it is special. You know, this way we uh, collected, uh, uh, we gathered a good botanical collection, uh, plant collection, and we work with uh, research institutes and with locals as well. There are many people who are involved in the group. There are many areas of activity. So if you find that this is what you need to do, if you, but you like uh, funding, this is one of the ways, this is one of the methods which is becoming more and more popular globally. Super, thank you. Are there, are there questions offline or online? You can uh, write your question in the chat or just raise your hand if you are physically present here. Andrei Strelnik of the Earth Physics Institute. Do you have experience of joint expeditions with the Russian Academy of Science? Yes, we worked with the Water uh, Institute of the Academy, uh, well, some limited experience. But in fact, we do cooperate with scientists from many institutes. Uh, we launched joint exhibitions with them. We work with people rather than with institutions, because uh, working with uh, and institutions is uh, difficult in terms of bi bureaucracy. Working with the individuals is much, much easier. Uh, Irina Fokina is asking the question. We are responsible for BRICS coordination. Out of all the countries which part who participate here today, uh, well, I know that you work with Africa, as you said. Who else should be linked to your cooperation to, for the purpose of joint programs? Well, in fact, not a long time ago, in, 19, in 2019, the Nature magazine uh, featured an article on international field expeditions, which was quite an interesting article. In fact, we see a lot of interest in many countries of the world. There's a lot of demand for that. But the many things are uh, hampered by legal aspects because uh, science does have problems with uh, legal uh, aspects. We need to be very careful about doing things the right way. Um, but otherwise, we, we've worked with uh, the Philippines, uh, Spitsbergen, uh, Finland. We wanted to also to, to do things with Mongolia, but because of epidemic, it was cancelled. Uh, it, in many cases, it's all at the level of one-to-one -one communication, personal communication. Of course, we know a lot, there are many people who uh, do science in the laboratories. That's good. But there is also a community of scientists who are eager to go beyond their field of interest. But this is not a, not a big community, but sooner or later we find each other and start to talk to each other. But you need to understand that the Russian Travel Geek project is not a silver bullet, but because there are many areas such as archaeology which cannot be done uh, in this way because you want to be a volunteer and working as a volunteer sit on the same site and dig and dig for for dozens of days for 20 days but travel geek is also about lecturing is about popularizing i based on what on my own research the thermophilic bacteria it's just a pool of water in very uh, remote and uninteresting places. But uh, in this way, I have an opportunity to go where I need to go and study what I am interested in. Thank you very much, Artyom, for your presentation. And uh, the next speaker will be Stas Korotki, astronomer, founder of the Ostrovert Astronomic Farm. Astronomy farm. Yeah. Hello, Stas. We can hear you and we can see you. you can five minutes for presentation and we will leave a minute for questions. Let me apologize from the very beginning for the quality of communication. I am beyond the polar circle. I am hunting for polar lights. Uh -huh. Видно мою презентацию? Подскажите мне, пожалуйста. Can you see my presentation? 
Хорошо. Тогда я начну рассказ. Manager of Kala uh, Observatory, which is private, non-government owned, which is unique because it was funded initially when it was built. It was funded by charity sources, but then it developed all on its own. And the idea was to make money on uh, all kinds of activities or works associated with astronomy. And the idea was to uh, offer astronomic excursions, tours, and lectures to anyone who is interested in astronomy. We work in Arhis, in, in the mountains, well, for nine years already. We deliver a course in astronomy. We uh, tell people about the evolution of uh, Earth, of the Earth and space in general. And one of the themes is to uh, to watch uh, met meteor meteoric events, and uh, this is uh, done jointly with international organizations who deals with who deal with astronomy. We also visit uh, the specialized astrophysics laboratory. Currently, we are located uh, in the polar area, and we tell people what the polar lights are, how they come about, and how they affect the Earth such as equipment, for example. Before the pandemic, we were traveling all over the world hunting for solar eclipses. And I, it is our hope that after the, when, when the pandemic is over, we'll continue to do that. It's one example of our expedition in 2015. It was a, a specially arranged aircraft flight. Uh, we followed the, uh, the moon shadow as it traveled through, through the regions. Uh, and from the, uh, we, we rented the aircraft, and about 100 people could uh, watch and film a solar eclipse in all its phases. And also, we're able to study solar activity from uh, air. It was a maximum solar activity period. And we also saw the area of. Uh, between uh, these, uh, the lighted uh, part and the shadowed part. So this was this is a way for us to make money, to earn money for our astrophysics uh, observatory. Теперь слышно. Отлично. Сейчас программировку the equipment that we used is as inexpensive as possible, and in this way we are thriftily spending the money that we earned. Another project is meteor surveillance. We record the meteors on video because the human eye is not good enough to watch the sky continuously, but here when the sky is clear, we watch meteors throughout the night. We also place video cameras in different regions so that we can more precisely identify the source of the meteor or the comet which dropped them. Now we have about 10 meteor cameras in this southern administrative dist uh, region, district of Russia. One of the recent projects is we are in the process of building a one-meter telescope. This will be the largest private telescope ever built to study asteroids, the supernova, and uh, other areas of space so that we can not only photograph those areas but also observe them visually. Thank you. Any questions from the audience? Uh, do we have uh, questions f in uh, the the online feed? 
In the chat. У меня есть вопрос. If not, I have a question to you. Сияние то увидели? Did you see the polar lights? Yes, we did. We've been here for four weeks already, and every week we have a new visiting group, and the, all of them were lucky enough to see the polar lights. We even saw the uh, space rocket launch from uh, the Plisetsk launching pad. Uh, so it's as uh, spectacular as uh, uh, anything. Congratulations. Thanks, Stas. Thank you very much. И слово предоставляется Варваре, директору летней школы. Здравствуйте. Презентацию, пожалуйста. Hello, I want ну, а пока она не включилась, я начну говорить. Хотя, мне кажется, она уже включилась. Да. Летняя школа – это свободный просветительский проект, который существует на данный момент, базируется that is currently based near the city of Dubna, not far from Russia. And this year we, we thought we need to not only to be based there, but also establish locations in other places. So 2020 was an online year, the online year for everyone, uh, for us as well. We adjusted quickly in 2021. We also had to rearrange our activity because the summer school activities are implemented on the mass scale. And uh, at any moment, the camp can potentially host up to 500 people, but the local government cannot, uh, will not always approve that because of pandemic. So ju just in six days, we rescheduled our activities and uh, we uh, implemented a widely spread summer school placing, uh, finding locations in many places, uh, but covering a big audience at the same time. In Dubna, if the summer school uh, were, were to take place in Dubna, it, will, it would look like this. Uh, we have a big history behind. So 2021 is an important year for us. We grew up from the a uh, school which was called Chimera. And what I like to do is to look at this statistics. We used to have just three workshops. Now, this year, we had 48 of them. So 42 are the new ones which were opened in our distributed summer school. This is a full list of this, this year's workshops. So this year our program uh, welcomed about 1,000 people. Some of the school-based projects were suspended, unfortunately, because of the pandemic. More than 50 percent of people are, who come to our summer school are motivated by their wish to learn. 18% 18, 18 of people want to just to spend time communicating with others, and there are other motivations as well. Let's remember 2019. This is some statistics showing where people tend to come from, mostly from the central region of Russia, but there are also people coming from outside Russia. So this is some, there are some more figures. Uh, our we are focused on academic science. We work with all the uh, universities that were just shown on the screen. Our goals, our objectives are science popularization. Uh, we help uh, school students to uh, learn about their possible future occupations. And there are many other objectives that we pursue. This is how our lectures are arranged. This is our conventional indoor activities within our camp. And by the way, we do all the repairs and all the decoration ourselves because uh, all that work is done all on a voluntary basis. Uh, they're not paid for that. Uh, all the uh, teachers are uh, volunteers. And uh, there are also uh, charity donations and they, which cover our costs, such as water, electricity, gas, etc. That's the way food is cooked. Every time 
Every workshop will cook the food for the entire camp of 500 people. Our principles are, the main one is during the summer school, everyone is equal. Uh, if you are on a duty, everyone, be you an organizer or a rank and file participant, you will have to serve the duty. We don't have the best and we don't have the worst. That is another important principle because our goal is not to is not for you to make a project. You need to be involved in a process. And as you do so, you need to develop yourself. This is how a lecture looks like. Uh, many, many popularizers come to visit us. Everyone knows us. And if you are willing to come, you can always do that. Several photos. We have people coming to us just to play, because we like sitting around a bonfire. That's what we do in the morning, and, the, and this is what we do in the evenings, the new year. And this year, and this is how we look, what we looked in 2021. That's a work. For, it was a just nearly dilapidated house in Danilov, and we had that summer school there. I'm done. Thank you. Fine. Do we have questions from the floor? Yes, please. Here's the microphone as you speak, please. Int what about international cooperation on this format? Uh, do you contemplate that, especially with the BRICS countries? What is the most interesting thing? Maybe people coming from various universities uh, to give a lecture or a collaboration with similar summer schools elsewhere? Well, first of all, we would love to share our experience. Our project, I think, is really, really unique because over 10 or 15 years we have grown into a large community expanding to all of Russia. We could share the knowledge and information as to how this should be done while being self-sustained completely. And of course, we would be interested in having other people coming to us. Could be a workshop uh, for people who would care to create something at their place, uh, looking at what we have done and do something similar elsewhere. And of course, we are interested in having teachers, lecturers, masters. And of course, we can agree on these things. So just email me. More questions, please. Uh, I'm sorry, maybe I missed out that information. The summer school is only for school children and undergraduates? Oh, no, 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 no. The summer school is not for school children or undergraduates. The average age of the people we deal with is approximately 25. Some workshops uh, invite people uh, much older than that. At my workshop, the average age is 28. And Artyom adds that, yes, we have summer school, uh, we have workshops for school children specifically. Thank you, Varvara. And now we're giving the floor to our international get guests online. Speaking first, Mr. Sujit Banerjee from India, of the National Children's Research Congress and Initiative on Exploration, Innovations and Science, uh, the Models of Successful Government Support. Yeah, thank you. Namaskar and good afternoon. Uh, greetings from India. Uh, I hope you, call, uh, you all can hear me. Great. So uh, I will... Uh, Sorry, you have five minutes for your talk, plus one yeah, minute yeah, for yeah. the Q&A. Yes, uh, you can uh, see the screen. I've shared the screen. Okay, so I'll move on. Uh, the Ministry of Science and Technology has a specific di division called National Council for Science and Technology Communication for spearheading science communication. And we have uh, programs for science communication for early learners, the youth, and the common masses. So for the K-12 age group, the kindergarten to class 12 age group, we have programs like Children's Science Congress, 
The second one is the initiative in research and innovation in STEM and the Inspire Award Manak. That's in, that involves the million minds augmenting national aspiration and knowledge. I'll come to that. Briefly speaking, the Children's Science Congress is an inclusive program for children of the age group of 10 to 17. The beauty of the program is that it not only takes includes the children from school, but it also includes children from out of the school. The school dropout children can also participate. They form a team and it is an activity-based program. They use their uh, learning of the science to solve some local societal programs. So in the community where they are living, they see the problems happening day in and day out. They use the knowledge of science to solve those problems. So it is learning of science by doing it. So, you know, I'll share with you some figures. Every year we touch base 500,000 children from all across India, covering 742 districts. And 1,000 plus innovation driven projects are showcased at the national level. The focal themes and sub themes are decided by an academic committee, which is in alignment with the country's priority areas like green uh, energy, the health of the nation. Currently, it is the sustainable uh, living, you know, to take care of the pandemic situation, which is prevailing in India. And it's very, very inclusive. We spread this program into the not so developed districts of the country, the hilly regions and the Northeastern states. We also include the physically challenged children so that they don't feel left out. So it is a local problem based, local solution based situation for the children. I'll come to the second part. I'm just touching very briefly because I have been given five minutes so in order to uh, nurture science and scientific uh, research among the Indian innovators, the young Indian innovators, we have this program called IRIS, in which it is 25 identified areas like biomechanical engineering, computer sciences, physics, they do the research-based projects. And we tie these young uh, scientists, young child scientists, with their mentors in the research labs who fine tune their research projects. Now, all the major uh, science fairs which is happening in the country, they are brought in and linked with this IRIS program so that all the child scientists across the country, they get a chance to participate in the International Science and Engineering Fair, which is the largest pre-collegiate fair in the world, takes place in US, and so far, I'm very proud to inform this August gathering that 33 students from India, young students from India, have their unique honor of having their you know, names uh, go to the minor planets. So each year, the grand award winners get their names uh, to go to the planet. So minor planets, asteroids have the name of the young Indian scientists. So this is the... <laughs> only have one minute left sorry yeah sure so this is the winning team uh, from 2021 and we have a huge amount of awards this year 17 although they participated in uh, in this fair in virtual mode there was no physical attendance in icef usa so with this i rest my case if uh, you have more than uh, any question and answer i am ready to answer them thank you Thanks a lot. Uh, do we have questions from the floor or from the internet? I have a question, if I may. Yes. Could you please uh, say what is the size of funding of these two programs by the government, approximately? Okay, so uh, the Children's Science Congress and both ISEF, uh, both are funded very liberally by the government. And uh, going uh, by the US dollar terms, uh, I should say it's quite close to about $1.5 million. And uh, the second program, IRIS, this is a, a program, it's a special program in the public-private partnership. 
public is the government of india and the private is our partner is broadcom usa so both of us you know uh, fund equally and it's close to about um, uh if i am not wrong 3.5 uh, uh, no 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 sorry it's about um, 8 million us dollar so it's co-funded by both this uh, government of india and the um the this uh, broadcom uh, usa funding has never been a problem despite the pandemic uh, ministry has got 20% increase in its funding year on year uh, in in the year 2020 and 2021 so our government is very liberal with funding and especially when it comes to the science popularization innovation uh, popularization because our honorable prime minister has given us uh, a, a dream of startup india so he says that we should have one startup per village per district of india which is not possible unless we popularize science unless we popularize innovation and all our startups uh, currently are all technology driven and knowledge based and we have a huge population of unicorn startups in india in the year 2022 uh, i think it's close to 12 unicorns which uh, were funded and which developed in the year 2021 uh, despite the pandemic thank you more questions please thank you very much Uh, есть ли еще вопросы? Do we have any more questions? Uh, спасибо большое. Thank you very much. Uh, давайте поблагодарим нашего спикера. I'll let us thank the speaker here. Thank you. Namaste. Thank you. И последний спикер из Китая, господин speaker, uh, Linde, директор Пекинского музея. Director of the Beijing Museum of Natural History of China. Own learning, uh, research, exploratory programs, BM and H for undergraduates. Thank you. You have the floor. Слышите ли вы нас? Can we hear us? Yes. Добрый день. У вас пять минут на доклад. Good afternoon. Uh, we can only give you five minutes for the talk and then a minute for Q and A. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Due to the time limits, I will be quick. It's a great pleasure to meet you all for this online event. My topic is on your learning. I will share with you some th thoughts on the scientific inquiry programs carried out in my museum. In 2021, we carried out three activities. Please speak closer to the microphone, uh, Professor. Please speak closer to the microphone. Okay. In 2021, we organized the three expeditions. For the public, we had a five-day expedition to Arling Hot in Mongolia, China, for students and their parents. The participants went to the excavation sites and did some field work. BMH organizes such expedition each year since 2005. As a matter for the pandemic control, we have reduced the number of expeditions. In 2021, we also had another two expeditions. For Macau students and teachers, this program is especially de designed and organized for Macau students and teachers, with the support of the China Center for Science and Technology Exchange and the Macau Science and Technology Development Fund. It has been carried out for 12 years since 2009, excluding the year of 2020 due to the pandemic. I'd like to share with you about the three points, the science popularization objectives, including the expeditions objectives and the resources we have and the ways we do it. We believe that scientific inquiry is the most important um, objective for these activities. People should learn the way to conduct scientific inquiry. And um, we are also consistent with the 2017 compulsory education primary school science curriculum standards in China. China has invested a lot in the educational sector and the Chinese parents are extremely aggressive in spending when it comes to their children's education. Recently around July 24, 2021, the government released, released new policy on further reducing the burden of homework of campus training for compulsory education in China. 
So well, we also, we are consistent with the science curriculum because the curriculum pays a lot of attention to the scientific inquiry. So with this new, with this new emphasis, we see that the students are more and more engaged in the learning progress. They're not spoon fed anymore. They, they are learning in groups. They're learning with more initiative. As you see, I wanted to quote Carl Sagan here, one of the world's greatest popularizers of science. And uh, he agrees that science is much more than a body of knowledge. It is a way of thinking. And our museum thinks that science is a process. And we want to show the process. And what do we have? Our resources, we have exhibitions, collections, expertise, we have lots of um, over 100 volunteers, and we have experts, we have docents, and we have our own laboratories, and we also have uh, built cooperative relationships with the uh, other uh, conservation areas in China. Each year we have, we hold uh, many events to uh, to recruit students, participants, and help them forge form the habit of uh, scientific scientific inquiry habits. And how we do it? I want to just list uh, seven uh, seven uh, features of our scientific inquiry. Activities. One is the layers of information. We see that uh, for any phenomenon, there could be different layers of information, at least the th three information, three layers of information. And we wanted to help the students get it to the third layer of information. And also, we think that the uh, 5e teacher mode is, uh, is best matching is most suitable for the scientific inquiry process. It has five stages. The students have to get engaged. They have to explore, explain, elaborate, and evaluate. And we have a structure. <laughs> you have only one minute left, sorry. Thank you. OK, thank you. And this is um, an example about our, action, um, our activity on the sequence of flight, uh, the bones. We are encouraging the students to analyze the bones of the bird. And I, also we have, we offer lots of preparation for the students before their solutions so that they can have some general knowledge. For example, thematic explanation, expert explanations, scientific discussion, dramatic explanation. And so we also offer teacher aids study sheet, and we encourage teamwork. Common goals in the icebreaker activity will allow students who participate in the expedition to do things together, even if they are strangers to each other. The members shall negotiate their own physical responsibilities. So to conclude, we have a very successful expedition programs, and we uh, get uh, enough students, student participants, in just uh, one day or two days. And uh, we think we have done a great job and we needed to uh, have more and more staff and uh, materials to support more activities it, uh, when the pandemic ends. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Do we have any questions? from the internet or from the floor, then I have a question. Uh, if we in Russia were to uh, organize an expedition to China, which place would you recommend? Where we should go? Uh, actually, lots of places in China. For example, the, you see the first two uh, slides we led the expedition to Inner Mongolia. 
where we have a uh, cooperative size and uh, the participants can carry out excavation activities and learn a lot about fossils. And we also can have uh, expeditions in Ningxia where we uh, can have a general discussion about how they place the uh, strata of their place. The geological form is uh, is shaped, has been shaped during the uh, geological times. So, and also we have uh, led uh, expeditions to conservation areas and to learn more about the habits, the living habits of animals. So I think, and uh, uh, as we have done before, we can have lots of places for, for your toys. Thank you. I hope I answered your question. Спасибо большое. Thank you. You have. Uh, do we have any more questions? Вопросов нет. Значит, завершаем нашу секцию. No, so we are closing the session, although we are ten minutes left. Thank you, and I thank the speakers in the first place. I'm just testing my audio.
меня слышно? Так, минуты через две, наверное, начнем следующую сессию. С двух. Так, добрый день, мы начинаем очередную сессию. Меня зовут Илья Ферапонтов. Communicate science knowledge, everything that uh, takes care of uh, the COVID, uh, COVID and uh, uh, quarantine, quarantine situations. Uh, we have with us Irina Belich, Igor Gorbachev from Nauka Channel, Dmitry Pobedinsky, who is probably one of the most popular media bloggers in YouTube. I advise you to watch his videos if you haven't done so yet. And we have two international speakers, Dr. Yao Mingtang from China, who will tell you about uh, uh, how to make uh, scientific sounds pleasant. And uh, Santi Borwach. From uh, Jan Prasach, who will tell us about uh, amateur radios. So let's start with the situation for him. We have a Let's ask uh, Dmitry to start from speaking about the channel. We have a very limited time for five minutes for presentations, and uh, we'll leave a minute for questions. Let me first uh, ask someone to 
I put my presentation on screen. Do we have a presentation? No. Here, it, here it is. Uh, Grigory Kompasuk from uh, the Science TV channel. I would like not to talk about the TV channel as such, but rather about science popularization from the point of view of available, available formats and uh, the preferences of the target audience. Our channel launches annual surveys to know how viewers or digital consumers uh, perceive scientific information. And this is more or less what we see every year. 78% of respondents believe that it is important to be aware of uh, science events and be interested. And this is important for success in life, by the way. And, uh, given that, the tools for studying audiences that we can borrow from uh, media consumption uh, demonstrate that uh, scientific interests are placed on the periphery of the general public interests because the, uh, there are other agendas which are in the center. Medioscope, which is uh, Russia's uh, major public opinion um, uh, surveyor, uh, this, uh, the, allocates the interest in this way. As we can see in percentage terms, popular science is not even seen. Hypothetically, we can talk about documentaries or educational videos. Just yesterday, we looked at some data uh, based on YouTube v views. And the picture is very similar. YouTube does have science and technology as a category. But as we see, the global as well as Russian public interest from the point of view of hours spent viewing it is at about 1.2 to 2 percent. We can also put educational videos in the same category, but they are also not really interesting, in, um, not a matter of interest to the majority. The mix of formats that are used now in the media world had its own evolution. But, uh, uh, as for formats which are used currently for science popularization, this evolution Dom dominates as a major factor, starting from offline, which is traditional lecturing, for example. That was followed at a later stage by popular science videos on TV, mostly limited to the formats of 26 or 44 minutes. Then it, it migrated to internet, and the belief was that uh, the public prefers shorter videos, and the videos get increasingly short. It was a myth, but it was only later recognized. So at the level of TikTok, the periods are even shorter. For science popularizers, this is a major challenge. How can you explain uh, some scientific uh, phenomenon in just a few minutes, in a couple of minutes? We believe that behavior of viewers, consumer behavior will change. Uh, but now we see a situation when, oh, in, recent, uh, in previous times, anyone who popularized science, such as even journalists who wrote about such things, had some time to win viewers' attention. Now, based on our own observations and some fragmented research, the decision about whether to continue viewing or not takes just a, one or two seconds, maybe a second and a half. If you do not, did not capture their attention in one second, they will not view you anymore. A few facts about ourselves as a channel. This year we celebrate our 10th anniversary. Our daily audience is about one million. We initially set ourselves the objective to target a broad and not really sophisticated audience so that the consumption of popular science 
films that we show would be placed somewhere in between entertainment and education, which is the useful part. And this is what makes us different from a large number of other more specialized popular science resources whose audience is supposedly more uh, knowledgeable and sophisticated. The Science Channel is probably Russia's largest producer of uh, popular science videos in different genres. We also expose the Russian audiences to the most important international uh, novelties. And this week, for example, we broadcast the announcements of uh, Nobel Prize winners. Uh, uh, we also shared forecasts uh, and uh, we uh, give explanation to, uh, of uh, what they were given the prize for the essence of their work. We are not limited to TV channels. We are present in the digital environment, uh, YouTube and the social media. And we see it as uh, something not connected. Content moves from TV broadcasting to our digital platforms. But in fact, t television audiences and digital channel audiences are not, do not really overlap very much. You if you take YouTube, Facebook, Odnoklasniki, or TikTok, um, do not cannibalize television. At least we do not believe so. We try to do both. There's one important initiative that we develop uh, is uh, our uh, contest, which is called uh, Film Science, Film the Science. This is what we've been doing for five years already. New platforms are now emerging, so both photographic uh, and video materials are easily produced. Uh, we believe that the range of authors that can work for science popularization can be as broad as possible, or at least we encourage our audience to be involved in this process, not only as consumers of this information, but also as creators. Well, of course, we are very practical in doing so because uh, we need to offer television products that are well understood by the audience that speaks the same language with them. And our ultimate goal is to nurture authors. One example is Alexander Ivanov, who is, uh, hosts the uh, uh, chemistry in Simple Terms channel. He's a blogger and for a number of years he's been our regular authors, author uh, g producing content which is all about chemistry. Uh, and now coming back to what I started with, our audience is uh, encouraged or forced to consume shorter and shorter F learning formats just f because of the nature of consumption nowadays. St but at the same time, science is increasingly complicated and less and less understandable to the lay audience. So these are movements in the opposite direction. So our challenge facing this reality is to capture the audience's attention. And what is key in this respect, what we sh should pursue in all the popular science genres is r not try to explain, but rather try to get them interested, to put at least some key terms in their minds so that as they get interested, they would then on their own learn that deeper. Thank you. Do we have questions from the offline audience? What about online? No questions yet? Let me ask one thing. What is the portion of your audience which is on, uh, on which watches broadcasted channel? I believe that it is quite costly to maintain a big TV audience, 
but uh, if you compare that online, how more or less profitable it is, uh, comparing to YouTube, for example? Oh, it's a very good question. Of course, television is expensive, any television. But unlike digital channels, television in Russia is a kind of industry which uh, is based on a certain set of uh, deeply set rules. You can argue about whether it is uh, fair or not, but uh, in terms of making money, we live we, and we operate uh, from the funding that we receive from our viewers. So in this respect, we operate as a self-sustained business. And in, in great respect, it is the revenue from our television projects that f funds our digital activities. Digital economy in Russia unlike traditional television, is uh, uh, much less established if we compare ourselves to actors such as CPM in, uh, in, in Russia. Advertising revenues in YouTube is only one-fifth of what you can get in the United States, for example. The Russian language videos may I have uh, five million viewers, but you will only earn one fifth or one sixth of what you can potentially earn if it is English language and if you work in America. Okay, thank you. Next is Irina Belich. She was um, founder of the science documentary, popular documentary uh, channel uh, project. Thank you for inviting me. But, uh, the final point was quite optimistic. And let me develop that. In fact, I, I work in the area of uh, remote formats. My and my uh, myself and my team of love online formats, but we also like offline communication with the audience. Uh, so I would like I would like to adapt to that uh, specificity, let me tell you what we do in a digital framework. I start with my favorite citation from Sergei Eisenstein, who is, was a, a prominent Russian uh, f film director. Uh, what is important in communication? There's a book which is called The Economy of Impression, or How to Turn a Purchase into an Exciting Adventure. Essentially, the idea is that impression is one of the most popular uh, good nowadays. So contact between science and the audience should be impression as well. So movies, cinema is the most effective, the most mass scale channel because it uh, works through emotions rather than some complicated formulas. You can also cite Plutarch who said that uh, students or the audience in this respect should be viewed not as a vessel that you fill but rather as a torch that you light. You need to encourage them to learn by themselves and this is what uh, cinema can do and Sergei Eisenstein confirms my words by this citation. Thanks. I would like to thank him uh, for this contribution. And now I'll tell you about our festival. We're called uh, the uh, Funk or Festival of Relevant uh, Scientific uh, Films. So Funk is a major enlightenment project which is based on authorship science films. We select the candidates at major festivals, such as in, in, in Italy, is Germany, uh, Advance Guard Festival. Uh, <coughs> Our criteria is that the plot must have uh, scientific content. It should be 
are artistic and it, it should have the potential for capturing the audience. So I always repeat, do not try to judge about any film based on the same criteria that we apply to a scientific paper. A film is not a description, but rather interpretation. Science is not the subject to be talked about, but rather a set of circumstances in, in which the plot develops, or just a context for the story. So on the background of the story, it becomes even more interesting and attractive. We have two main formats, the city festival, which uh, has just uh, finished in Moscow with the uh, full box d despite uh, the pandemic limitations and uh, on the digital side we have the wonderful project the days of scientific uh, films funk this is a unique activity one of the greatest largest festivals uh, in the world is uh, definitely the largest in Russia so this is a franchise based festival we put together a program, we produce promotional materials, and from October to December, we can use any site. It used to be universities, now it can be any educational center, or just an, a group of initiative, uh, initiatives, a, a group of uh, uh, enthusiasts who can uh, uh, do their own funk festival. All this that might take place under the brand, the funk brand, because it is a franchise, and then then report to us afterwards, and they are supposed to uh, demonstrate all the films that we uh, allocate to them. We mm, had uh, 300 uh, places there uh, where uh, that uh, was uh, festival was to take place on. Mm, and we received uh, one and a half million of views uh, um, on different uh, with three channels. Now this year, uh, that was last year. Now we have 400 sites, more than 100 cities, and we keep receiving applications. I think we will eventually come to 500 sites. This is the broadest possible festival coverage. There's no other festival that has such broad coverage. What makes us unique is, is first of all, it's the largest one uh, among scientific film festivals. Um, uh, we have a small team, by the way, just uh, five people. And imagine how big audiences we cover. Apart from exposing them to high quality documentaries, uh, of the sort they will see nowhere else. We also uh, talk to them about uh, popular science events. And the people can fantasize on the basis of that, being creative, uh, working around the basis with some additional events, doing something else on top of viewing movies. And overall, we try to promote this topic last year I lectured on scientific documentaries at ITMO uh, with participation of the Ministry of Education. And this year we also managed to have the Russian delegation of producers of scientific movies to attend the online version of the international festival, the first time a conference and festival on popular science content. Uh, a few words more about the last year's event, uh, some pictures for you to make acquainted with. That's uh, the full-length documentaries uh, made for the large screen, and we want people to go to the cinemas, to the theaters to watch them and also do the organization. What, else, what do you need to do to join the project? That's very easy to do. You need to have some equipment and a site. You can fill in an application for participation and you will have your personal account where you will receive a link to download, to upload your content. Uh, you will get some promotion material and then it's up to you 
it depends on how creative you are. You can invite people, you can think of how to attract the audience. It's truly up to you, and of course, you need to send the report to us. Some figures for you to know, 300 applications last year and more than 400 applications this year that we have received. And let me stop at this. Oh, for, sorry. Uh, talking about online format last year, uh, a professional orientation program was launched last year. We tried to make brief interviews with scientists where they would be answering questions from the young people about what it feels like being a scientist, researcher. That format, I think, has been quite successful. By the way, it's all been posted on YouTube, but that's not our major. That's what we do on top of our core activity. Right, that's an additional online track that we launched during the most severe lockdown last year, but everybody liked that. Was that an attempt to keep the audience during the pandemic? Right, exactly. We had been thinking of closing down, but we managed to stay on. Any questions from the room or from the internet? Good afternoon. Maybe it's an off topic a little bit. Do you know production firms in Russia who produce scientific movies? If you have a, an idea for a script, where should I bring that? Well, maybe the TV channel Nauka Science is the right address. Well, why don't you go to the Ministry of Culture? or maybe the society knowledge. But it's not just a script, just one script. Uh, maybe uh, you should work with, uh, well, no, it depends. We can work d directly with authors, providing them with all the uh, infrastructure required to shoot a movie. But we are very selective in uh, choosing the applications and making decisions. But it's worth it's worthy of making a try, of course. I'm from Institute of the Earth Physics, Russian Academy of Sciences. I was not very clear. So you are a venue for the authors to send their films, and then you would help promote them, or do you help in making the movies? For instance, we are preparing a movie about a scientist, we can send you an application for your approval, and then uh, you will help organize the production. We are not a production. What we do is showing movies, but we can give you good advice on production. Uh, we're about uh, making the audience watch your movies, provided the format is right. Uh, only uh, well-known directors will work with you or scientific uh, organizations? No, scientific organizations do not make the content of the kind we show. It's mostly directors, production companies that we work with. I have never seen an organization, a scientific organization, to be involved in producing a movie. They know the subject matter, of course, but making a movie will require having a budget, and then you need to be, you know, what a drama is. You need to know what a market, what the market is. Overall, I like the idea where re researchers, uh, scientific organizations want to do something, but I always uh, advise them to refer to the professionals, because a movie is not a corporate video, you know. Have you met Olga Sefanova? Uh, she made some movies in the Antarctic. Yes, I know her. And that was exactly the case, where people hired a professional director to make a, a documentary, Olga Stefanova or Stefanova. Oh. No, no, that was not. Uh, okay, I can look up some names for you. You know, my point is, understandably, researchers know the subject matter, but making films is a different profession. You, you cannot possibly master it in 15 minutes' time. So you need to find a director, inspire the director, and find a budget. And you can find an, file an application with the Ministry of Culture. 
So you file the uh, uh, synopsis, and then it's up to the professionals to work with you to make your idea into a movie. I have one brief question, if I may. Regular movies migrate over to various platforms like Netflix or Oco in Russia. Have you thought of building a specialist platform for scientific documentaries when cinema theaters are really closed down forever? Well, let's not think about such horrible things, but, well, making a separate platform, I don't know if it makes sense. There is Curiosity Stream, there is Netflix uh, that is accessible in Russia. By the way, they do invest now in uh, scientific content. Uh, Nonfiction is another platform by the Center for Documentary Films. We haven't thought of building a platform of our own. Uh, we are just in talks uh, discussing things with the existing platforms, which we did last year. We uh, approached to you for the streaming and uh, Megaphone Galax was used. Uh, they expected us uh, that they would have 100 views per week. Actually, it was 40,000 people who viewed our movie last year, which was a very good result. This year I attended the event myself. If a film uh, is included in the FUNK uh, program, that's a sign of quality. Thank you very much. Unfortunately, we are past our schedule. Dmitry, you have the floor. Good afternoon. Thank you. I think I am the closest to the remote format because what I mainly do is uh, blogging on YouTube and uh, that's uh, the only thing I do. I cannot see my viewers, uh, only indirectly I can understand what is the way to interact with them. So what about some life hacks and methods that I use in, all, in my work in order to my videos be watched and popular? The first thing to mention is uh, working with Data analytics, BI, and uh, the uh, intestines of the YouTube uh, that produces some information about the about what really goes on there. I would say that formats are becoming shorter and shorter all the time, from long films to TikTok movies, and the average time could be just seconds nowadays. I haven't noticed anything of the kind. Uh, as I looked at the data, I knew that long formats, uh, they were quite viable. 20 minutes, 30 minutes, even one hour was quite okay. If you fit the audience, the target audience, then it is all right. I do not feel that I must shrink it all, squeeze it all into just a few seconds. Uh, another important thing is the way you work with the audience in the comments section. I think something similar to a, how to put it, a home chat to be created, where you can discuss all the problems. So the comments under your content should be a cozy atmosphere, something comfortable where you sit down with like-minded people to discuss your content. Or at least you could pretend that that is what you are doing and that helps. Another important life hack is uh, the selection of topics to tell about. That's the most difficult part because I cannot see my audience. And surveys and polls are really helpful, uh, talking with people in the chat. And the way I see it, there are topics that my audience like, 
there are topics that I like, and the overlap of the two multitudes are lies the core that I should be working on. By the way, as regards working with the audience, contents are really helpful. Any means and things to involve people and platforms like YouTube allow to do that easily. Uh, таких вот штук, но как-то выкрутиться. On the screen, I think that's a winning approach because formats differ. Uh, people use cartoons or drawings, whatever graphics. Uh, sometimes they use sand graphic images that they put on the screen. Uh, of course, it is always authored by actual people. But if you see a living face in the screen. That should improve the audience, the loyalty of the audience. If you can rely on a particular person uh, with their image, that is only for the advantage of the project in nearly 100% of cases. Well, I think I'm done with my life hacks for you. Uh, questions from the audience, please? No? Have you, have you noticed any decline in the size of audience uh, or increase uh, about your films on physics, for instance? Well, uh, the number of views has increased and the depth of views has increased. As I mentioned, you shouldn't be afraid of making long videos during the pandemic. I noticed that even further, that a long for the long format is in good demand. Uh, the one half of the audience will survive to the last minute. With me, I mean, the depth of the viewing is exceeds 50%. I think that's very good, isn't it? Yes, that's a good indicator. Uh, some people are better than that, but I'm above the average. Thank you. Now, for our international speakers, I'm giving the floor to Sandy Barwa. Sandy Barwa. Uh, uh, do we have a connection? Good evening. Uh, you have the floor. Yeah. Good afternoon. Can I go ahead now? Да, вы можете начинать. Yes, please go ahead. Yeah, good afternoon. Namaste from uh, India. Uh, I'm Sandeep Borra from Bigan Pasar. Uh, we have been promoting amateur radio, colloquially called ham radio, uh, for last uh, more than 30 years, actually. I'm involved since 1998 in promoting amateur radio. Amateur radio is a very old technology that is still being used, and it is one of the oldest mode of social uh, networking. When internet was not there, we hams were capable of communicating uh, using our uh, computers connected to radio, internet type of communication. So people don't know, students don't know. So we outreach to the students and engineering colleges in India um, to uh, imbibe an attitude of uh, uh, do-it-yourself activity in electronics and radio and telecommunication in the field of radio and telecommunication. So this is my station. And our Vigyan Pasar and NCSTC uh, started this promoting activity, amateur radio promotional activity, back in 1992. Uh, we have a communication, two-way communication, worldwide two-way communication uh, station uh, run by our department. And uh, one interesting thing is that when I was a student, uh, I used to communicate to Russia, uh, like this card, during those days we exchanged with each other. So you see, this is a part of the history uh, one card from Russia, this is Arastral Russia, I think, Kamchatka. So these are the cards we exchange when we communicate using radio waves. So 
uh, one of our prime ministers, uh, late Rajiv Gandhi, he promoted MSR radio uh, among the kids uh, because uh, it can imbibe an interest uh, in electronics and radio communication. I think five minutes is too short a time for me uh, to deliberate uh, uh, what Vigyan Prasar has actually done during the last 30, year, 30 years. So that's why I'm quickly just, uh, because our organization is an outreach organization. So we are into publication, we are into uh, video, audio video programs um, and workshops, trainings. So I have organized uh, more than 500 uh, outreach programs during the last 20 years. Actually, I am a license holder, government license holder for communicating using this type of radio. And uh, you see, um, this type of radio can be used actually before the advent of the internet or the mobile phones or the smartphones. Uh, we were using these type of radios where keypad is the same like the mobile phones. It is the same. And we, we used to uh, message each other using our radios back 20 years ago. People, people during that time didn't see that. So social, social networking through voice and through radio, uh, through data, it was existing since a long time. But people don't know, students don't know. So that is what Vigyan Prasar is trying to uh, make the people aware about it so that there are more people who become self-reliant in two-way communication. And we make the feeling of international brotherhood more stronger when we communicate with other countries. We experiment with different antennas and uh, different radio technologies. So that way our kids are actually benefited. Last year, I'm going to just share a slide. Так, а включите, пожалуйста, презентацию. Sorry. Uh, we need someone to put the presentation on screen. Yeah, I'm just trying to bring the presentation. Сейчас, секунду. Just hold on. Продолжим без презентации тогда. Можете продолжить? Я прошу прощения, у нас техническая накладка. I think I'll close some of the screens, then it will be visible. Получается? Yeah, yeah, it's coming. It... Any success? Yeah. Okay, amateur radio promotional activities by Vigyan Prasar to impart science and technology skills in the field of electronics and uh, telecommunication. So uh, the governmental agencies have their own radio communication channels already existing. The police, armed forces, paramilitary forces, fire departments, all these people have already uh, this uh, uh, two-way communication exist already existing. But then why amateur radio is the second line of communication and the need to promote it? Uh, we promote it uh, to capacity build among the people, self, to make the people self-reliant. It is the only scientific activity in the world which requires a license from the telecommunication authority of a country. It is a do-it-yourself activity where radio communication experimenters get an authorization to communicate anywhere in the globe. So it is a skill more important than any other sports from national security point of view, also to build a technically advanced resilient society. This is the reason NASA promotes it. In fact, 
Russian MIR, the erstwhile MIR module, the cosmonauts, they used to uh, transmit uh, in amateur radio frequencies where we can communicate using small walkie-talkies like that. So we can uh, make two-way communication with uh, International Space Station and Russian Military Academy, they also transmit pictures using amateur radio frequencies. So the students can actually receive a picture in their computer uh, by connecting a radio. So these are the technologies that we try to uh, 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 try to uh, uh, train the students in the uh, schools, technical schools, and also uh, the other schools. CBSE has incorporated it uh, uh, into their syllabus in 2006, Central Board of Secondary Education. So they have, uh, this is a CBSE guidebook, uh, CBSE syllabus, they have incorporated uh, this uh, as an alternative communication system. So they, they have also covered our activity, when we communicated from our office uh, to Andaman and Nicobar Island when the, the all modes of communication failed. So it is a very unique mode of communication where training is necessary and one has to appear for an exam for the license and after that one can set up a station like this. It is an alternative mode of community communication empowering people in a specific branch of practical science to learn the electronics and radio communication to make the people self-reliant in radio communication technology, to imbibe an interest in the art and science of radio communication technology, and a do-it-yourself activity for school children. For example, uh, last year, we trained 400 students in Kolkata during India International Science Festival, and uh, our department actually was uh, uh, proud to receive the Guinness Book of World Record, where maximum of 287 students uh, built a toy transmitter uh, uh, at the same place, only within 15 minutes. So this was the uh, diagram that this is a book brought out by the campus, a do-it-yourself book on electronics. So this is the circuit diagram we have used uh, to assemble FM transmitter. The students practically assembled within 15 minutes, 400 students assembled, out of which 287 students could uh, make, make those transmitters, toy transmitters functional. But these are not toy transmitters. But if we uh, teach them uh, the electronics, the making of toy transmitters, later on they can get a license and talk to all over the world and make a social networking, alternative social networking. And uh, it is not like the conventional social networking because, because when we do communicate, we are already identified. In Facebook, uh, lots of fake things uh, going on. Lots of fake things going on in Facebook. So we cannot immediately identify a person. But in case of amateur radio, a person is already identified. For example, when I communicated with uh, this person, uh, this person, it is listed in the telecommunication department's directory. They, they have a directory database in which he is identified. So Facebook is not like that. So lots of uh, mischievous activities nowadays going on through social networking, apart from the good things, of course. Uh, but in amateur radio, we always uh, try to learn the technologies and uh, it's a good way to make friends and learn different things related to science and technology by talking on the radio. So science clubs, we are trying to promote it in the science clubs pro, uh, by providing books. Uh, this, is a, this is a guidebook brought out by the Pasar. Then this is a small brochure brought out by the Pasar. And of course, this is another book we brought out. And by the way, this is uh, brought out by me in 1989. In 1989, when I was appearing for the exam. We must apologize and uh, we are very short of time. We're sorry yeah, to cut you short, but that is, that is the limit. Yeah, this is Russia, Russian embassy where we organized one program during Gagarin's achievements. So these are some of the programs that we have been conducting uh, throughout the last uh, 20 years. So I'm going fast as time is very limited. So I, uh, I would like to thank uh, the organizer of BRICS for uh, allowing me to give this presentation. I have to be very quick because it was told to me five minutes. So I'm very sorry that 
I am not able to present everything so fast. I hope uh, I get to you uh, pretty okay. Thank you very much for listening to me. Большое спасибо за содержательный рассказ. Это... Oh, thank, you, thank you so much for this presentation. And of course, it's uh, fascinating when uh, uh, all technologies uh, are so useful. I do have uh, one question. We have no questions yet. If not, we um, now connect to the next uh, speaker from China, Dr. Yao Mintang, please. Hello. Uh, I will share my screen. Добрый день. Yes, can you, can you see my slide? Yeah. We can, uh, we can uh, hear you, and we do we do see your slides. Yes, please, please begin. Thank you. Okay. Hi. Uh, my name is Ming Tian. I I am a senior science program officer of Beijing Guoke Interactive Technology Media Company. It's a great honor to be here today and share with you our experience and the thoughts. Of course. Uh, let me. Uh, yes. Gokur is a famous plant science company in China. We are dedicated in providing responsible science and technology themed contents with uh, inter interesting and uh, diverse means. We advocated a science-based uh, rational lifestyles and our works convert a variety of areas, including a science uh, popularization, of course, and science education, creative cultural products, events, exhibition plannings, uh, etc. So since the company was founded in 2010, we have attracted more than uh, 50 million followers. The vision of our company is to make the science popular. So it's uh, quite fit, I think. We would like to convey a uh, positive and scientific knowledge to the public uh, through a high quality contents and uh, products. So by transmitting the value of scientific rationality, we are also dedicated to promoting science in the public life and contributing to citizens' scientific literacy construction. Uh, about 10 years ago, it is not difficult to do science popularization works. Uh, the online articles were the major forms by the time, and by telling stories and writing in plain language, we can already make science and technology look interesting. And that turned out to be a very successful and well received by the audience uh, at that time. The, oops, wait, 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 wait. Yes, the popularization of China's first lunar rover, Yu Tu, was a very classic case at that time. Uh, my colleagues created the character for the Yu Tu rover. He's a little boy, he's brave, strong, and loves science, of course. And he's a hardworking, quite down-to-earth, but somewhat a slow type of person. With the support of Xinhua News Agency and the National Space Authority, we set up an official Weibo account for Yu Tu and started telling the lunar adventures in his own voice. Uh, to those who don't know Weibo, Weibo is a, a Chinese social media platform like Twitter. So on January 25th, 2014, the lunar rover had a sudden broke down and after about 20 days, it was repaired. Instead of giving a technical details during this event, U2 simply tweeted two sentences. So one is what you can see here is, oops, I broke down. And another is, hi, is everyone there? These two simple sentences got about 150,000 retweets and about 80,000 comments. And that makes China's space program and things related to the moon become a soft after topic of public discussion. But soon after science popularization become more and more difficult, first the emergence of the new media platforms turned everyone into self media. Then came the uh, popularity of smartphone and 4G technology. With the faster internet speed and the cheaper expenses, everyone's daily life is becoming more and more fragmented. Science popularization has been thrown into a more competitive market, and we have to compete with the entertainment, the sports, the celebrities, and gossips, 
to grab the public's already uh, fragmented time and energy. These new circumstances came along with new challenges, such as how to create the public's demand for science and not to mention how to let them accept the science. So in this respect, we realized that we need to learn from advertising and salesmen. And this is what we call the marketing of science. It means to convey the information in the subtle way while satisfying the needs of audience and promote our products of science popularization. That says audiences are our customers. We, got, we go to wherever they are and try to satisfy their needs first. Uh, I will give a few more examples. Interesting contents are always more attractive than their rigorous science. It's not only important to explain science in an interesting way, but also to reveal the science behind the interesting facts. So for example, sweaters usually uh, shrink after being washed. This is actually quite common in our daily life. We first propose an interesting question before all sweater shrinks when washed. Why are sheep not strangled to death when they got wet? Then we revealed the science behind these questions from the structure of the wool to the principle of gear connection. We even link the wool sweaters to other things commonly used in life, such as a zip tie. And in this way, we arose the audience's interest to continue digging. And to attract audience, the form of a pr product is equally important to its content. So how to attract someone who is not that into science and even make them willing to pay for the science popularization products. Our fish scrapbook provides a good example for that. This uh, beautiful scrapbook had an illustration on each page introducing one kind of fish cuisine. We have embedded the massive information about the biology, environment, and the culture that related to the fish cuisine. People who buy this scrapbook don't necessarily care about the knowledge of the fish, they buy this because of its beauty or because they like the tasty cuisine. And many customers will use it as a food map. They will look for and try the cuisines then show off to their friends. But as long as they use this square book, the science clue hidden in it will have a chance to pick the interest and arouse their curiosity. We also brew our own beer. It's a very good India Paul L. Uh, those who consume our beer certainly don't buy it for learning. But being the customer of our beer, they may also de develop interest for Fibonacci's rabbits, the Pavlov's dogs, and Skinner's pigeons. And of course, science popularization works cannot be done without the scientists. We, oops. We assist the scientists with the public outreach of their research. The scientists are also our customers. They are in the upstream of the supply chain. So to begin with, we also have to address their needs. And one of our projects for the Chinese Association for Science and Technology is called I Am a Scientist. And this project aimed to establish a platform for the scientists who are interested in science popularization. In this case, Except of establishing the platform, we also have a professional team to help the scientists who don't know how to outreach. We help to optimize their presentation slides and to train their stage performances. In other words, we provide professional services to help scientists communicate better with the audiences and to better popularize a science. The topic of our discussion says a uh, full immersion in a research area. Well, I do have a different view about this. It's too challenging to immerse the public in uh, Sorry, we can only allow one more minute. Yeah, it's enough. Uh, I think what we should do is to take an opposite approach to immerse scientific research in the public life. Making science part of the daily life, uh, only then can we really make science popular. So I will end uh, my story today with a quote from my colleague. We are all people who sugarcoat science. And that's what we should do. Thank you.
Спасибо большое. Один вопрос, если есть. Uh, if not, let me just thank the guest speakers. Thank you very much for your concise presentations. And I would like to thank the, thank the audience for your attendance and uh, participation.
Здравствуйте, дорогие коллеги. Good afternoon or good evening, dear colleagues. Да, сейчас good слышно. Morning. Замечательно, спасибо. Well Рада вас приветствовать на Welcome to the спасибо всем, кто тоже. Thank you for the survivors of this forum. Thank you. завершающая секция, но точно не последняя по Our final session for now. Uh, we're going to talk about civil science and science volunteers, or citizen science. Basically, it's a broad idea how to involve uh, citizens in science popularization projects. It's a pleasure for me to moderate this session because what we do in Russia is just making the first steps. While our colleagues and counterparts in other BRICS countries may be more advanced, and it should be really interesting to exchange experiences and opinions. So without further ado, I'm happy to introduce the first speaker now. Citizenscience.ru project People of Science in Russia. Первый в России национальной платформе Tell about the first ever platform of citizen science in Russia. That's the venue where science and volunteers can find each other. Nodar, you have Nodar Lahuti. Uh, the time living is seven to ten minutes each. Please stick to this so that we have some time left at the end for Q&A. Nodar, you have the floor. I'm Nodar Lahuti. Uh, chief editor uh, of uh, citizenscience.ru. Okay, do we have a, my presentation to put it on? Well. What is the most important is what's the point of having this project around? It is a twofold point. First of all, we wanted to give science, uh, supply science with a tool which is more and more popular globally and uh, which is part of a global trend, but I'm not going to elaborate on that. And the second go is what is characteristic of human beings uh, being curious and making something of significance leaving a trace leaving your trace in the world which is a very interesting and relevant need that every human being has irrespective of their level of education and it would be good to find a good use for that so, I wish I could show you some pictures, but I can't, sadly. I'm not going to tell you too much of our achievements. Instead, let me focus on the mechanics, the way it works. We opened up a year ago, and we still, we are still the only platform here in Russia doing the same, which is bad. I would like to see more people doing this. Our project is a twofold. One is original people of science, and the other part, Experion, that is dedicated or focused on the analysis of visual data. I will tell you more about it later. Some details, some data are as follows. Over the year, we have had 115 published projects in all the three major areas of citizen data analysis, data analysis, data collection, and data delivery. As you fill in a questionnaire or uh, sitting down wearing uh, a foil cap, uh, that is for human beings to supply 
other people with their data. Uh, projects are quite large with analyzing of thousands of satellite images. And we have more than 4,000 users, which is not bad at all. Most importantly, several dozen of grateful scientists who say uh, how happy they are to have found us, uh, which is the most pleasant thing in what we do. Uh, I would love to show you some pictures about what we do, but I'll have to do without them. Let me begin with the way a project is built. Uh, it is a tool, so as we design a project, we try to view that from the perspective of future users. That was not very difficult to do because more than one half of ourselves are people with an academic background. So it was relatively easy for us to understand the perception of someone who is used to writing papers on chemistry, for instance. The overall idea we had was like this. Since the first thing a researcher should do if they know what they want to do. Sorry, uh, sorry to interrupt you. Uh, we have some time. Why don't we uh, switch places? Maybe we ask. We should ask Roman to put your presentation on because it doesn't make real sense to do without your presentation. Yes, of course. Good idea. Well, if it is possible, maybe I'll let our, our technicians try to put the presentation on after all. Sorry for this. I'm inviting Roman Pereborchikov to speak. He's going to tell us about how to involve volunteers, and then we will get back to the citizenscience.ru. Roman, Just you have the floor now. Well, I feel myself as a bit of advertising for some uh, some uh, previous stage in the development. No, no, you're not. You are the rescuer of the situation now. Oh, OK, so I shouldn't feel myself like a commercial. I shouldn't feel like a TV commercial in between the content. OK. What I do is trying to involve volunteers for the organization of popular events. Uh, I hope my presentation is on. It is. Uh, the Gutenberg's Smoking Room, that's the title. Uh, that is the way uh, we looked at our peak sometime in 2018. That was a large network of volunteers in about 40 cities, cities in Russia, most of them, uh, mostly in Russia, sorry, um, uh, and many, many cities abroad, uh, such as Belarus, Minsk and Gomel, would try to work in Kiev, Ukraine, uh, but unfortunately there has been not a single event there since then because of, let me put it this way, technical issues, plus for a few months, uh, we settled in Prague, uh, but then we stopped. The project originated in 2014, and over the next 18 months' time, we turned into Russia's largest volunteers project. We had about 15 branches, and the way we worked was we would find the organizers, regular people, users of social media who would be willing to organize a lecture or another science popularization event with participation of scientists. Volunteers are, by definition, people who did that, who did the organization only because they were willing to help in the enlightenment effort. They would be looking for scientists who gave their presentations or lectures for free, uh, sharing their presentations or discoveries, or just sharing their knowledge uh, unrelated to their actual work, like uh, field, uh, fields of science such as astronomy or some such. And the audience would be similarly didn't 
pay for the attendance. Anyone was free to attend, so there were no there was no money involved uh, or nor any party concerned with getting making profit and before the pandemic that had been quite an advantage for ourselves because it allowed us to scale up uh, without looking too much at our costs uh, we could r reach out to many many cities involving many people and many scientists to those events because the idea of enlightening the society was a very cool idea that is something that the society perceives very well at, at least until the moment uh, when the government starts to threaten to put you behind the bars so our project was quite successful we had held about 800 events uh, with about 1,000, 100,000 uh, physical attendees. Uh, some recordings of lectures were posted on the internet, uh, which collected about 10 million views, which was not bad at all. I would add that the way it worked, uh, how such a project could be done, uh, where you take resources from if no money is involved. And the main thing for us, we didn't have an audience, uh, but the moment we started to do it, we were able to find like-minded people on the social media uh, by attracting science popularization groups. So, and it went off like a barter. We would suggest uh, the platforms or groups to announce and advertise their venues, their audience would get some entertainment and edutainment uh, with people able to come here to view a recording. So they were getting the content, we were getting the audience, which allowed us from having zero a zero audience to expand to several hundred thousand and then shortly afterwards up to about one million people exactly thanks to the collaboration with the partners on no commercial terms involved at all because that was the idea of enlightenment if you don't make money on that you shouldn't be charging for that that's what many people thought Unfortunately, now, because of the pandemic, we do not do event organization. We have to do online formats. There are projects other than this Gutenberg's uh, smoking room, but uh, who similarly lost the offline opportunities, and that they have to go online. Uh, but the principles remain the same, even online. The only difference is that you attend online rather than offline as previously. Well, that's the whole point of my case. Science popularization is a cool thing, and even if you don't have the money, you can still do that, because the idea itself is worthy of spending time on that. <laughs> Questions from the audience, please. Thank you, Roman. We do have time for the Q&A. We don't seem to have questions. Actually, I could add something what Nodar had time to explain because volunteers are attracted to with uh, the essence of the activity. Our audience, which was about 200,000, our audience proper, why don't we come together? Because many people would like to participate, they are short of uh, some activities. If we don't have questions, I'm passing the floor. I have a question, if I may. Could you tell us more, please, about how did you, how the idea had crossed your mind? Now we know that the Gutenberg smoker room exists, but that was not a trivial idea at all from the very beginning. Uh, could you explain how it all began? Yes, I can. Thank you. 
Курилка, как само well, название. Well, Gothenburg Smoking Room, the very name, appeared sometime around 2011-2012, but for two years or so, uh, the format was different under the management by, of other people. That was the closed book club. So lawyers or economists, having read a science, a scientific, a popular scientific book, uh, would care to tell other people about biology or physics, whatever. Accidentally, I attended such an event, and I thought that uh, why don't uh, we try to invite not amateurs but specialists? And the then managers decided that that was a classy idea, but they uh, didn't care to do it themselves, and they gave it over to me. There was no structure for the project. I had to build it all myself, but it all happened in 2014, which was good because the desire of the society to participate in the development of the um, citizen, citizen initiatives was at the peak. Many young people were keen on active participation, so the uh, time was ripe. Uh, we picked up several events ourselves in Moscow. Then people from other cities started to write to us. And at that time, in Russia, there had been lecturing places around, but those were held at universities, research centers, museums. Uh, there were some closed volunteer, volunteering-based projects, but their audiences were very narrow, 20, 30, 50 people. So our project came as a breakthrough of sorts because we were the first to do projects for the audience of two, three, five hundred people, even one thousand uh, or two thousand people uh, at an offline event. And soon offline lectures uh, came into fashion thanks to our branches and thanks to the people that knew it was possible to do it this way. Other projects came along, and this lecture format became popular, although it was brought on thanks to our project specifically. So it was fashion. Uh, uh, science popularization became fashionable. It, the fashion appeared at some time uh, to start to actively develop, but over the years we have worked on the project. The peak was around 2018. By the end of 2018 and in 2019 and in early 2020, we already observed a certain decline in the interest on the part of the volunteers that might have been caused by some societal developments. But instead of 30 branches, we had something like 15 branches, or maybe closer to 10. So the project was shrinking at the time, although we tried to work harder in response to that, uh, producing higher quality in the remaining cities. So the way it was launched, that was uh, a societal development of phenomenon which created fashion and that didn't require any specific knowledge about organization. It was enough to be able to tell a true scientist from a false scientist. That was the key prerequisite. If you can do that, then your audience will be dealing with actual science rather than fake science. We were lucky enough to do without any false science around, but the main thing in a project like that was an inner desire of the people to do this kind of organization. Because if you have no initiative, 
however many such people you have around, they wouldn't be able to do anything good. So if you have uh, a bunch of such enthusiasts, uh, you can hope that uh, the project will uh, be a success. Thank you, Roman. It was really, really exciting. Okay, I think our second attempt will be successful. Uh, let me respond to the final message. There are two layers here. One, on the one hand, there is some fashionable trend, and the format may go in and out of fashion like any other fashion. But volunteer-based approach to science popularization is much more permanent. No, I'm not arguing against that. I'm not claiming that volunteers have a, a limited potential. But instead, I'm saying that there is a in a fashion for different formats and lectures are no longer that fashionable compared to what they used to be. And this is our key personality. It's not just a hedgehog, not any hedgehog. In fact, there's one very time-consuming project uh, associated with hedgehogs, uh, which we spent the whole uh, spring preparing. And that is um, an illustration, an example of uh, many of our issues. We are, apart from uh, being uh, academics, uh, scientists, we are also translators. The so translation takes place when we try to translate things from uh, scientific language to popular language. So we sometimes struggle with ourselves uh, trying to rephrase what we know in a very different style and structure. So we have to struggle with the authors as well to convince them that uh, the number of terms that they want to squeeze into their texts is un unmanageable. Uh, the public will not accept that. So in this respect, the project is really outstanding. Yes, it's interesting, but uh, it's very time consuming. A lot of effort is put into that. I hope this will work. So, how did we end up there? Uh, I've showed before some of the facts, and this is how it works. This is what we have. How we can describe what we have and uh, how can we describe the approach that we took in our project. Our priority was to maintain a structure which has a limited number of elements because it makes the work easier, it makes building the process easier. So I will uh, go point by point. The project's uh, design kit is a separate component of the project. Let's, you can compare that to uh, Lego game or cubes from which you build all kinds of things. You get just give uh, the assignment, the instruction, instructions, and uh, volunteers will go on and uh, build what they need to build. Mapping tools is used on the main uh, people of science web portal. And it is linked to specific locations. In, Ro in our Russian project, what we did, it was, uh, we re uh, received data from volunteers, and then that data was localized. Uh, tags were put on the map, so the volunteers would immediately see where uh, research has already taken place and which other locations are not yet covered. So you can immediately see where volunteers collected data and what they collected. And of course, questionnaires is an obvious thing. Now on the volunteer, this is all for scientists. On the volunteer side, we found it very convenient, uh, very important to make the use of tools convenient for users. So any website visitor should immediately see where to find the things that they need. Uh, so that must be able to understand what it's all about and where to search for the required information, which part of the screen provides that. 
The same about the second point, which is uh, clarity and uh, brevity. And uh, this means we respect their time. We should not force them to read large texts or think a lot. But instead, they need to be able to understand things quickly. And lastly, that's about experience, first of all. What, let's imagine you have a big number of uh, space photograph, photographs and you need to sort them out in some way based on some parameters. If you have volunteers doing all that, most probably they will not do that because it's tedious work and it's not exciting and it's, uh, well, it takes too, too much effort. But if you build uh, a chain of simple decisions at the level of yes or no, so like a logarithm, it's, it's much more exciting. You can go step by step, you can go back, not much intellectual effort is needed, you don't need to sit for hours, you just answer simple questions, one, two or three, and then you go ahead. It's much easier in this way. Now to the project as it was created. The People of Science project. The idea behind it was to turn the process of uh, project creation or project description into a process of filling in certain cells of information. Each cell or container would uh, be filled with a piece of information. This is, has a lot to do with academic uh, style because the structure is very different. When we allow the author, the scientist, to, uh, to stop thinking about the structuring task, but rather just to uh, give uh, the piece of information, and then it takes care of itself. And there are many, many other things which we put into that. Of course, we provided as detailed comments as possible. There were some arguments whether or not we need such level of detail, but I always insisted that uh, the more details, the better. Uh, the link on the right is of special importance. Some people prefer to read theory first. Uh, other people prefer to start by looking at the specific examples. And we took that into account. And we also uh, split science as such into 12 categories. We also allowed users to add subcategories, but for convenience of search, based on the big amount of information that we have, we decided that there should not be too many categories. The same true with experience. This is exactly the kit uh, that uh, the the design kit that we uh, talked about. Structurally, it's uh, different from what I described before. There are five stages. They're not necessarily consecutive. You can uh, do them in any sequence. But if you deal with the big uh, mass of data, you uh, download data there, but you provide a description of your project, you give the instruction, and if there's someone who is eager to work for you for free, you will give all possible information to that person. Please note the prompt to the right. I believe that uh, you should always pr provide some textual explanation that you will not have to search for. It must be placed right before your eyes. And that helps a lot, especially those who deal with such a tool for the first time. And this is an example of uh, our very recent project, which was put on the website uh, just yesterday. It's about paleontology. One tag, tag number one, is just an overview. And the idea is that you provide a minimum textual contact to answer the basic questions, such as what it's all about, what is the purpose, uh, what volunteers are supposed to do, and then if you are interested, 
what you do to join it. And there are certain some limitations, we also mentioned them. The next tab is the what to do tab. Sometimes there's very little text, sometimes there's a lot. If it's just a questionnaire, there will be just one line. Please fill in the questionnaire and that's all. This is uh, not even average, but uh, many minimalistic approach. Because, in fact, the projects are very different in terms of content and the type of information that is used. Uh, sometimes we can uh, provide awards, some experimental uh, projects in the uh, High School of Economics. Uh, is, uh, can even provide monetary award, but we do not do that. The next uh, tab is uh, learn more or detailed description. Normally it's a detailed description of the project, specifying who created the project. There is a note here in parenthesis. We do encourage students, bachelor, master degree students, or doctorate degree students to provide their own effort, to give their own effort to such projects. And we support them and encourage them as much as possible. You can also put your own text here. Sometimes the scientists would uh, fi uh, feel that uh, they need to, to, d to write something, uh, to give their own wording. Now to experience. Here description elements are the same, but they are placed in a different sequence, in a different order. Here, please note the tag, the tab called instruction. The idea is very obvious. Just because we're dealing with uh, masses of information and a number of assignments, you will need to clearly explain what is required. And this instruction will always be available, accessible. This is a piece of the instruction. If you, for example, ask people to sort out photographs based on certain parameters, so for example, whether a certain phenomenon is or not, is present or not present on the picture. Sometimes it's not obvious, even for professionals. And the, the, uh, prof the pro authors of the project from the Pacific Ocean of the Russian Academy of Science uh, had some difficulty explaining it to us. Sometimes the assignment is very simple. That is the choice between yes and no. This is important because not everyone will be prepared to go deeper into that. But the most uh, easy thing is uh, to say yes or no. Do you see it or do you not see it? And the, uh, the prompt is always uh, present because it's an important part of the structure. Now to the general principles. I talked a lot about the simple, struct uh, simple structure. And the next point is algorithm. Anyone who visits the site should uh, clearly understand what can be done and what is expected of them. Uh, nobody should be lost. Transparency. I will give you an extreme question, but it's very clear. Uh, recently, we failed to publish a reasonable project for one simple reason, because the author refused to, t to share his uh, personal name, claiming uh, that it's no. personal data. I will not comment on that, but uh, imagine what I thought about, how I could respond. Well, if we invite someone to participate in something, we need to know who we deal with, so we always share the names, the information about the people who organized, maybe students or academics. We believe that that information is important. And of course, feedback is important. I always take time to respond to requests, inquiries, questions. That is important. And one of the preconditions for success in any volunteer activity is uh, the existence of power, powerful horizontal links. So feedback is key for that. Now, what we are planning to do next? 
where to go. Oh, sorry, you have just a couple of minutes left. I think this is the last one. I'm almost finished. Would like to have a capacity to process video data. I have a favorite project under uni under the under the project under the under the project. Yes, uh, and uh, there is a simple question: What what is the mouse is doing? Is it uh, uh, sleeping or is it uh, climbing climbing the wall? Mm, and this is uh, uh, an indication of the status of the project. Uh, another possibility to use is uh, to use uh, platforms uh, where people could easily access them using their portable devices wherever, wherever they are. S volunteering in the science is, uh, has a one strong capacity, and that is the mass scale nature of it. For example, if we structure uh, photographs of a galaxy, of course professionals will do it better than an amateur, but what makes volunteer science valuable is that there are many people answering those simple questions. questions. So it may be one photograph that may be allocated, that may allocate it Sorry, one picture may be allocated by seven people in one way and by one person in another way, so probably the seven are right. So we uh, can approach uh, crowds of people such as those who are, uh, who may come to a, a railway station and they, while they're waiting for the train, they can easily do that. Also, volunteers. Uh, can be easily attracted, but the question is how to keep them interested, how to maintain their interest. So, based on research, we know that horizontal links and some internal groups and communities that uh, discuss certain aspects of the problem, they commonly uh, jo they join efforts searching for answers or solutions. This is a very powerful tool for involving volunteers and keeping them involved. Finally, uh, sharing experiences, exchanging experiences is important. For example, experience in creating projects may be valuable. So if you are searching for a, an answer to your scientific question, this in itself can be a project in volunteering. And there are many opportunities that can be given to people so that they know potentially what they can do, how they can spend their time. Well, this is done in mostly online now until the pandemic uh, subsides. And that will be the end of my presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Nodar. I have a question. <laughs> Did I hear you correctly? Uh, saying uh, you saying that your, there are about 4,000 people participating in your project. Well, we have 4,000 people registered, and they participate in different projects. So about 4,000 is the total, right? 4,000 registered users. Any statistics about uh, how many are active, how many are passive? Well, it's not it's not exactly that way. Oh, in fact, in the main in the main part of the project, we we ran out of money. We wanted to do that statistics, but uh, for, unfortunately, our budget is limited. Well, on the main site website, most of the projects are uh, like a marketplace. In experience people can work on the website, inside the website. But the, the People of Science project normally uh, refer people through the link to somewhere else. Uh, sorry, Roman, we, we have two more speakers. Our time, our time is running out. And uh, it's time to invite uh, the next speaker. The floor is yours, please. Is that...
now the turn for Pala Bagla from India. Is that right, Alexandra? Right. Yes, I hear you very well. Welcome. Lovely. Uh, very warm welcome to everybody from India. It's uh, late in the evening here. For many people, it could be early morning, it could be late night. And I'm delighted that I'm participating in this uh, Science Popularizers Forum for the BRICS countries. Uh, to introduce myself, I am a science photojournalist. Uh, so I presume I am a citizen also. And because I report science, I can say I'm a citizen for the world. And I have reported extensively uh, from almost all the BRICS countries, uh, except having stepped in Brazil, where I have reported next door from uh, French Guiana and other countries, but not in Brazil. So, so China, Russia, India, all over I have reported, and it's great fun to be participating in this. Uh, I will share my screen now, which will have a few slides. All right. My talk is essentially about when the science, when science meets the public bridging the gap. And my experiences of a, a photojournalist who has worked extensively for the last 25 years, uh, mostly based in India, but reported from across the world. Uh, currently, I host a, a weekly show called Life and Science with Palav Bagla, uh, and which is on a channel called the India Science Channel. Uh, it's India's national science channel, a 24 by 7 internet-based OTT channel. And I also am a photographer with Getty Images. Uh, unlike many others who have heard, uh, my own experience says uh, the public loves hearing about science. As long as you can communicate to them in a language they understand, they will certainly, uh, they certainly like uh, watching, hearing, reading, all about science, technology, health, and environment. All one has to do is to do it in a very clever way. But more recently, scientists essentially seem to be losing the plot when it came to communicating with people. And it became worse uh, when we saw when the COVID-19 pandemic came along. Uh, there was so much uh, uh, wrong information and there was almost an infodemic. I don't like the word fake news because journalists like me and journalists all over the world don't give fake stories. It's misinformation which is done by motivated people. Uh, so, so there was an infodemic, but by and large, scientists have been able to get their message across through the help of various media and also the help of journalists and communicators like me. I have considerable experience in uh, doing what I do, which is communicating science. And a few years ago, I also did a book with Springer, which is one of the world's largest uh, publishers of science, which is a book called Bridging the Communication Gap in Science and Technology uh, Lessons from India. Uh, it's available uh, across the world through Springer and also through uh, 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 Amazon. And, and it, it, it's a 350 page book which illustrates how India does its science communication. And India has had a long tradition of communicating science, uh, both in the media which we understand, which is television, print, and internet, but also in folk media, which is through dance, dramas, paintings, and other media. But what I learned over time is that scientists and academicians, they really need to dialogue with the public. 
if they don't dialogue with the public, that is when the gap becomes bigger and bigger. Uh, if scientists don't talk either directly or through communicators, that's where the gap increases. And many a time I have felt that scientists need a bit of training in how they need to communicate. Uh, not every scientist is a born communicator. Most people, in fact, have to learn that skill. And I would strongly urge the BRICS Science Popularizer Forum to have a kind of a, a hands-on training exercise for different scientists from across the countries, which could be small workshops for people who want to learn more. And towards that, I always say, uh, the best outreach which happens is through using all formats. And unfortunately, most scientists seem to look at only the press release and the written word. And a press release should never, in my opinion, be longer than an A4 page, and it should have some contact details. All press releases, in my opinion, should always accompany with still photographs and video footage. Interviews, quotes, uh, if you see the most recent, in the last couple of days, there has been the announcement of the Nobel Prizes. And the moment the Nobel Prizes are announced, you see the plaques come up with the, uh, the painting of the, the scientists themselves with a small blurb on it. Uh, so one has to look at information, infographics, and all of that. So I would strongly urge that scientists and the people who are doing this particular session for BRICS countries look at hands-on training exercises for scientists. And I'm sure there are plenty in the audience in Russia and also online who could probably help out. Uh, again, over years, and I'm saying this with a certain uh, confidence over years, which I have seen, uh, scientists and public are really made for each other. From the cradle to the grave, today science and technology pervades all lives. So people want to know more about science and people want to learn how different technologies work. Yes, there can be places where there are hesitancy, like we are seeing in, in the usage of vaccines in some countries. Imagine a country like America, considered one of the most uh, advanced developed countries, but there is so much vaccine hesitancy there. Uh, whereas look at India, where already 900 million people have been vaccinated and it's a, it's a very, very large number. So in a sense, it's really not difficult if scientists put their mind to it, they can communicate, uh, they can communicate with the citizens directly, they can communicate through citizens groups and winning the trust back is critical. And for that, really, scientists need to make an honest effort. Uh, I have done 15 years of television, so I will show towards the end, if the chairperson permits, two small videos of one minute each, which is about specific efforts in India, which we undertook during the uh, COVID-19 pandemic. And essentially, that is a part of making an Sorry, honest... Sorry, I just, I just ask you to finish in something like two minutes, please. I'm, Thank I'm, you. I'm getting at the end of it. One of the last slides I want to show you is that civilian science done in secret helps no one. If you keep it hidden away, it really doesn't help anybody. So all of us, just do it. That's the simple message. And with this, I end my presentation and I take and show you two short videos. The first video is about a mobile lab which India developed for COVID-19 testing. In the middle of the pandemic, I went into the lab wearing a PPE kit to show people they don't need to be deeply scared about the virus. It's a touch and feel video. Let me try and share it with you. Ah. 
I'm wearing the full PPE kit. And inside, look, in India's only mobile infectious disease diagnostic lab, it is currently set to post COVID 19. I don't think there is any other lab of this kind uh, anywhere in the world which is so fully equipped. So this is a lab which actually goes to people and uh, does testing on the spot. So be it a rural area or an area which is really very difficult to access and it has uh, all the uh, infrastructure, required infrastructure to do nucleic acid based testing, antigen based testing and antibody based testing. Watch this episode of Life Science with Palau Bagla. Second video I'll show you is about masks. Masks became the in thing for controlling the pandemic. And very early in the pandemic, India adopted universal masking. Uh, masking was adopted by India in April of 2020, way ahead of a CDC advisory or a WHO advisory. I'll just show you this is a one minute video, man. Asking India, saving the world. On this episode of Life in Science with Pala Ubagla, watch the science behind using masks. We need Indian scientists who gave the recommendation that India should use masks. To protect the population, it was best that we uh, get something which anybody and everybody could use. And then we thought we can do, safely use homemade masks, which can be used by any old uh, reused fabric. We also visit Kul Meher, a facility which is blossoming life. Let me meet a startup born from IIT Delhi with a connection to the Department of Biotechnology and how just in the lockdown period, this startup has earned revenue of more than two crores. This one is a pre-printed mask in which all the layers are antiviral. Life through masks. What life in mind to follow Bangla on India Science? With this, I stop my presentation and I'm happy to take questions. Uh, I work from the world's largest democracy where asking questions is the in thing. So I am very used to asking questions as a journalist, but to be asked question would be an honor from this global audience. Uh, thanks a lot for the participants from Russia. I really wish I could have been in Moscow. I really love that city. I love the feel of the Red Square and my, my trips to St. Petersburg and to Siberia have always been memorable. I wish I could have really been there, but for the pandemic. Uh, thanks a lot for giving me the time. It's a pleasure talking to you. Thank you. Thank you very much for your talk and for your kind words. We maybe take questions at the end of the, the session if we have time. And now I would love to introduce our final speaker. From Brazil, Daniel Lauras, Minister of Science, Technology, Innovation, Brazil. The Department of Science and Technology and Innovations in Brazil, Mr. Lauras. You have the floor, please. Go ahead. Good afternoon. May I have the slides? I don't know if my slides are ready. Please. Thank you. Okay, I'm trying to show some uh, projects of uh, popularization of science. It's not this, the other one. Here, okay, nice. Let's start with this. This is a magazine 
Uh, it's done by volunteers, te math teachers. Uh, I belong to this group, so I know, I know it very well. And it's, um, it's a beautiful project because they are making some difference. They propose, they have a group. This is, this is a WhatsApp group, but they try to overcome the group in, in the idea of a magazine. It's an online magazine because it, it born in the pandemics, but uh, this, they are spreading the idea and we have math for every kind of people. We have fun math and we have hard math too. Uh, we love your examination papers from MIPT here in Moscow or Gaokao from China or from IIT in India. So we use all this material to spread the idea of, map, of math, uh, but mainly the, the job is to spread math is fun, uh, math can be good, and there is a great barrier with math in Brazil, and we know uh, basic science specifically, math is uh, essential for other sciences. So this is a beautiful, beautiful project. It's a joint venture from a lot of volunteers. Uh, some of them don't know each other, but they can work together to uh, perform a great job with this uh, mag magazine. Uh, this is fantastic. This is, this is just one person. His name is Junior Miranda. He called, her, he called himself the man of space. And in Brazil, he's known as the man of space. Let's see why. Uh, he's somehow a space technology specialist because he's a specialist. <laughs> but he is uh, a space exploration history researcher. Uh, he's, in fact, a mechanical drawer and a teacher. So he, he, he holds a BS in IT, but he loves uh, exploration of space. Um, um, his job is fantastic and covers a variety of things. Uh, this is some um, published in the net about his work, and he is officially a 3D, 3D uh, illustrator of the Roscosmos magazine, uh, due the quality of his uh, job. So he's known uh, far from Brazil. <laughs> um, they are, his models, they are uh, perfect, as you can see. Um, the variety of details, uh, he's alone. He's alone, and despite his job is is alone, he do he does his job alone. He's being invited for other uh, popul uh, other science popularizers to to join in other groups. Um, he's also an author an author of books. He's an illustrator of books, and. Okay, a lot of books here. And he also does some model of spacecrafts and rockets. Maybe you know some of these spacecrafts, I believe. <laughs> this is his uh, YouTube channel. And um, he is being invited. This is uh, the, in this picture you can see uh, Junior Miranda with our minister. I should repeat, our minister Marcus Pontes is our only an astronaut. He was launched here by, in, at Baikonur in a Soyuz, and um, he's very special. So his engagement in science popularization in Brazil is very important for us. So we, are, we belong to a special secretary dedicated, fully dedicated to the popularization of science. And as you can see, our minister participates itself in this program. So uh, it's common, we invite people such as Junior Miranda to participate in these lives with uh, our minister. Beautiful project and very detailed, as you can see. Okay, again, Nicolinha, I have already uh, 
shown the, his work. This is a little girl, eight years old, and he is doing a fantastic job because it's a job because he, he, she can influence uh, ch children like, like her to engage in science. So he has, uh, she has uh, her networks and he's spreading science. Um, he, she's being invited by our minister too to participate in some of our uh, programs and she's doing, she's doing a great job. Thank you, Nicoline. <laughs> Uh, this is another beautiful project, is the Asteroid Hunters. This is led by Silvana, she's here. This is a partnership with NASA, with IASC. And the goal is to find asteroid, asteroids in images sent by IASC. Uh, so, uh, every student of the country, no matter uh, where you are, you can uh, enter in this project, you can participate, and you can find an asteroid. This is very interesting to rescue the self-esteem of the students. So it's an international citizenship science program. And there are more than 2,200 schools in over 80 countries. Um, all certificates are personally signed by our minister. In Brazil, we... Uh, in this image, we can see, in this picture, we can see uh, Tsere. Tsere, uh, he is an Indian, as you can see, uh, and he engaged in the Asteroid Hunter program. In this picture, he is in a live uh, with uh, Silvana. So, uh, some people helped him to get uh, access to a computer in the way he can participate in this uh, beautiful project. Um, you can realize uh, what importance there is when an Indian can participate in a program like this. What we can, uh, we can spread the idea for every student of the country that it's possible. You can, it's possible, you must only believe in what you are capable of. Okay, here we have other students and they um, are being prestigiated because uh, they have been trained to be trainers. So we are using the engagement of these young people in order they can spread the program along, all over the country. And of course, the impact over these students is very good and we gain scale because they help us to spread this idea all over the country. Uh, this is another program. This is Science at Home. This is an initiative of our minister and we try to have a hub of this kind of initiative. It's a web hub in the way we can spread what is going on all over the country. We want to, we try to enhance the work of Nicolinha, of Junior Miranda, of Asteroid Hunters. So it's a hub. Uh, science Olympiads, we want to spread news about science. We are using our minister to be a hub of science and technology. Not only news about decisions and loss of science and technology, but also for the popularization of science. Um, other strategy, we do a lot of webinars. This webinar is the light, uh, it, that's because the International Day of Light, so we invited a lot of scientists to, uh, to give a lecture in this uh, webinar. This is another webinar. This was uh, led by Semaden. Semaden is the National Center for Disasters Pre Prevention. We have a national center for this. And we learn a lot, a lot with their job. They can talk about uh, uh, the problems of climate, etc. It's very interesting. And they engage a lot of uh, young people to help them with these signals all over the country. Um, we have a lot of lives. Our minister used to participate in every life we, we, of popularization of science. He 
his agenda, he has a full agenda, but uh, he is always with us in this task. And this was a seminar of astronomy and astronautics. It was an international seminar. Uh, we engaged a lot of students in the seminar. We invited a lot of scientists all over the world, and it was very good. This is the National Month of Science, Technology, and Innovation. Due to pandemics, we have a decree from our president. In the way, we have a national month, and this month is October. Uh, during this month, there are a lot of uh, seminars, challenge, interactive projects all over the month, all days of the month, because we also have a national week of science and technology. Because of the pandemics, we extend in a web base, in a web way, to a national month. Uh, the web, the national week it was a presential event in more than uh, 100 cities, supported by our minister. We, we, we have some budget for, for this. And the, the interaction is fantastic. Okay, and here just some pictures about what we are doing. And we believe in Brazil, volunteering is very good for popularization of science because our people is very natural. So they help a lot our job. We are government, but they help a lot. We would like very much to thank everybody and to learn with other countries how can we enhance uh, these strategies. Thank you. Right, so uh, Alexandra asks her forgiveness because of, oh, sorry, Alexandra asks her forgiveness because her baby has woken up, so, <coughs> sorry, I'm instead, that's on the, all you've got. Uh, but we're going to wrap it up, в смысле свернуться собираемся, я прошу прощения, не сразу переключаюсь. Now I switch to Russian. Uh, so we are wrapping up uh, this forum. It's been a long day, and uh, some of you are sitting late in the evening, and everyone is tired. But we learned a lot of interesting facts and information, and it's great to know what is happening in the very different parts of the world. But we see that uh, these things are developing in more or less the same direction, which means probably we're doing it the right way, all of us. Well, thanks again, uh, and uh, hopefully we'll see each other next time. For sure.
дорогие, uh, дорогие коллеги, дорогие друзья, students, colleagues and friends, we are closing our science popularizer forum of the BRICS countries. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank the Civic Chamber of the Russian Federation, the Ministry of Science and Higher Education of Russia, the Presidential Grants Foundation for their support, and also the Ministries of Science and Technology of all the BRICS countries who participated and who helped involve the, and invite speakers from the countries to make this forum happen. We know that our participants here in the room, and especially speakers, found it challenging to uh, do this in this mixed format because of the special situation, the number of people that we could uh, uh, receive here was limited. So let me share some figures that will encourage you, hopefully, uh, especially, I mean, will encourage the speakers. Over the two days, we had more than 3,000 participants in this forum. And I would like to thank the organization from the city of Chelyabinsk. They helped us technically to arrange uh, this uh, broadcasting. So we combined multiple systems. We had Zoom, uh, which uh, connected us to most of the speakers, the CBN system that uh, w was broadcasting to China and also connected us to, with some Indian participants, and of course, two YouTube channels, one Russian and the other English. All this technology was at our disposal over the two days, which of course made it easier for all of us to connect remotely. And most importantly, it made available, it made all the recordings available so if somebody, somebody had problems connecting or did not have time to attend uh, it online, they, they will be able to view materials afterwards. So in conclusion, I would like to ask some of the participants and speakers and moderators to say final words. So first of all, I would like to ask our uh, colleague from Brazil, Daniel, to share his impressions. What do you think about this forum? I would like to thank you in the name of our Ministry of Science, Technology and Innovation to thank you very much for the invitation. Uh, there is a huge amount of information we are going to work on in Brazil when it came back. And um, uh, the enormous amount of different things we have learning during these two days. I would like to thank you very much, everybody here. We are feeling very, very embraced. Everybody, technicians, the team of translators, you were perfect. We, we were able to understand all the lectures. Uh, it was a pleasure to be here. We hope uh, we brought something new from Brazil, something different. And I believe this is just the first popularization forum, so maybe next time we can be together, maybe near a beach in Brazil with a hot weather, <laughs> something like that. But um, it was very good, uh, um, the difference between and what we have in common, the idea of the popularized science for young people, for the common citizen, it was uh, an enormous pleasure. Thank you very much. Thank you for this uh, high estimation. And now I would like to ask the moderator in the universities in uh, communication session to 
say a few words. She represents the High School of Economics as a research university. By the way, I recommend everyone who attended uh, the other uh, panels, panel session to go back to the uh, recording and uh, listen to that session because it was very important for all of us. It talks a lot about university involvement because uh, young scientists from universities are valuable participants and I hope that this will also help us to move along the other uh, lines. Thank you for invitation. I'm happy to know that the High School of Economics, my university, was participating. And this is specifically the case where you have this magic feeling of uh, growth from uh, a small session in an office uh, with just a few people uh, to such a big forum in just in a matter of months. It means that horizontal links do work and I'm very happy that I had a chance to participate in the uh, conceptualization of this forum. As regards our session specifically, I was saying that the universities are important drivers for science popularization. And this is exactly the situation in Russia. Universities constitute a major player, and maybe the most important player there. And especially given the, pro the 2030 program that we are approaching, I do hope that universities will do more and will be more involved in the popularization of science. I was very happy to see our Brazilian guests who came to here, and also I saw col colleagues from uh, India, ch China, and uh, South Africa, and I was uh, fascinated by uh, th those colleagues' participation in the uh, panel session, and that was very important for my professional contacts and experience. Thank you. I it was exactly in that session that we were saying that uh, in the forthcoming Forum of Young Scientists, it is planned for next year in China, we can introduce uh, one specific section session on communication. Uh, because based on the results of uh, our session, they uh, were they are ready to do that. So, colleagues from China prompted us to uh, make put this into our plans for next year, as we participate in the forum. And now I will ask one of those who inspired the inspirer and ideologist of uh, this. Uh, event, Mikhail, who represents the Gutenberg Smoking Room and the Science Slam, and uh, maybe Taxon is also uh, his project. Well, l let me rather say a few words on the behalf of the organizers, on, on my own behalf. We've completed a big event that uh, is very meaningful, and you can go deeper into that meaning uh, afterwards, mm, you, we should give us uh, ourselves a, a thought about what we have talked about, and that uh, valuable uh, amount of information that we have uh, put on the surface will definitely be uh, shaped into documents that we will put on our website, on the forum website. All the videos will be available, and they will stay there forever. Be sure to join us. If you missed any event or any session, you can go back and view the videos. It was a unique event, because on one single site, we brought together representatives of a large number of educational and enlightenment projects, uh, and it's a snapshot of uh, uh, of what the community does, and it is important for its future evolution and development. Thank you very much, and I once again I would like to thank all the participants. So we've done the two days, but we continue to work and cooperate, and hopefully we'll have more joint events uh, between our countries.
Thanks, everyone.